Good afternoon. The first item of business this afternoon is a debate on motion number 10736 in the name of Shona Robison on the legacy of the 20th Commonwealth Games in Scotland, Humanity, Equality and to Destiny. Could I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now, please? And I call on Shona Robison to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, you have 14 minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. With the spectacular success of the Commonwealth Games and Team Scotland record medal hall fresh in our minds, I'm delighted to address the Chamber on the legacy of the Games this afternoon. I'll reflect on the opportunities brought about by these Games, touching on the core Commonwealth values of humanity, equality and destiny, and I'll look forward reflecting on the need to maintain momentum and drive and to building upon the strong foundations now in place for the benefit of Scotland. From the outset, Legacy has been central to the planning of these Games, with more than 50 national Legacy programmes in place. People across Scotland and the Commonwealth are benefiting now. We have reaped the rewards of record levels of investment into Commonwealth Games sports, with Team Scotland's highest ever medal hall. They delivered the biggest ever Scottish team, with 310 athletes securing a record-breaking 53 medals and four new Commonwealth Games records. Such world-class performances, uh, supported through a, a system delivered here in Scotland, are an inspiration to us all. Scottish disability sport and other governing bodies of sport now stand ready for an upsurge in interest, harnessing enthusiasm through the Unleash Your Sporty Side campaign. The Working Group for Sport identified that Scotland has world-class sporting facilities to complement the world-class sporting system, and these are being used by performance athletes and communities alike. They include many used uh, within the Games, such as the Sir Chris Hoy Velodrome, the National Indoor Sports Arena, the Commonwealth Pool, but also excellent facilities such as the Aberdeen Sports Village, Regional Gym Gymnastics Facility in Dundee, and many others. In fact, since 2007, over £100 million has been spent on new and upgraded facilities. We have £25 million committed to support the development of the new National Performance Centre for Sport. Uh, a further £20 million has been made available through Sports Scotland's National and Regional Sports Facilities Fund. We have seen over 100 projects that have been supported by the £10 million Legacy Active Places Fund. And just prior to the Games, I announced a further £50 million for Sports Scotland's Active Schools Network, providing pathways between school, club and elite levels, and that's not to mention the 133 community sports hubs in development and or operational across all 32 local authorities. Turning to the economic legacy, um, Games procurement is estimated to have supported as many as 30,000 jobs. The £500 million spent on the Athletes Village over the last six years has on average uh, supported around 1,000 jobs and contributed £52 million to Scotland's economy each year. And through our national legacy programmes, 5,000 events-related training and job opportunities are available across Scotland for those who can most benefit. We have worked hard to ensure contracts were accessible, with 69 per cent going to Scottish businesses and almost £1 million being awarded to supported businesses. Next, we will help companies take that new confidence and capacity to international markets. And with a major international business conference and more than 90 business events held at Scotland House, we engaged over 1,000 national and international business leaders, helping to strengthen international connections. The conversion of the Athletes Village to housing will leave behind a well-designed residential area where before there was a 90-acre brownfield site. Major transport projects completed ahead of the Games are helping to open up the area to further development opportunities. Legacy is also evident in the events sector where an additional 37 national and international events have been secured worth £14 million. And this bodes well for the sustained use of Games infrastructure. Alongside the sporting action, the cultural programme saw over 1,500 events and thousands of performers at venues across Scotland. In Glasgow, over three quarters of a million visited the Games' live zones, cementing our reputation as a truly creative nation. As well as providing an unprecedented opportunity for tourism, these Games have attracted Commonwealth heads of government and state, as well as numerous other international dignitaries, individuals taking away a lasting impression of why Scotland is such an attractive place to do business, invest, work, live, study and visit. I have no doubt the success of these Games will continue to be felt throughout Scotland for many years to come. 
Now let me reflect briefly on the core values of the Commonwealth Games, humanity, equality and destiny. Presiding officer, from the outset, Glasgow 2014 has been a truly inclusive Games, with para sport fully integrated and the highest number of medals ever. Visitors and athletes alike saw firsthand what it's like to be a country whose government is committed to an equal and fair society for everyone and has a progressive approach to human rights. The rainbow flag has been flown in solidarity with the LGBT community across the Commonwealth. Pride House welcomed over 6,000 visitors through its doors. The Scottish Government launched its One Scotland campaign in the middle of the Games, promoting the message that Scotland believes in equality. It is vital that these Games are a positive force for inclusion, not just for the weeks past, but for the decades to come. Presiding officer, our para-athletes have performed fabulously at these Games, winning seven para-sport medals. And that's why I'm delighted to announce today £6 million as part of a £9 million investment for the development of a new national para-sports centre. Based in Largs, Sport Scotland's National Centre will nurture and hone future sporting uh, talent here in Scotland. It will complement our network of world-class facilities and will allow for a future Eric Davis, who amazed us at Toll Cross, and Neil Fahey and Aileen McGlynn, who rode us to the podium in the velodrome. This centre will be the first of its kind in the UK. And I think a testament that sport can truly be a powerful catalyst for change. Yes, of course. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, thanks for the intervention. I, I'm, I'm delighted by this most welcome announcement, as I do, indeed I know will everyone be uh, connected with the National Sports Centre in Verclyde. But I'm just wondering, Cabinet Secretary, if you can advise the Chamber how this will now be taken forward in order to maintain the momentum and drive you mentioned earlier in your speech. Cabinet Secretary. Well, first of all, I should uh, pay tribute to uh, Ke Kenny Gibson because he has been a, a real... Uh, advocate for the Inverclyde Centre and um, it has uh, helped to, I think, uh, bring people together to look at the future of the centre. So going forward, um, Sports Scotland will be working very closely with uh, North Ayrshire Council to uh, plan the development of the new centre, which um, uh, will include not only the new uh, National Parasports Centre, but I know North Ayrshire are keen uh, for uh, uh, their school estate to be involved in the development of, of the new centre. And I think that would be a really good uh, balance of use and will give Inverclyde a whole new lease of life. And I'm certainly happy to keep the member informed as those discussions begin uh, to, to go forward in a more detailed level. Uh, looking ahead, um, presiding officer, I'm sure you'll agree that we are well on our way to securing a lasting legacy for Scotland, but today does not mark the end of legacy. Legacy didn't end with the, uh, the closing ceremony. We've got to look ahead to 2018, when the 21st Commonwealth Games will take place on the Gold Coast. The eyes of the world will be upon us again, and we want to show that we have indeed continued to deliver a lasting legacy. I'll obviously continue to provide uh, drive and leadership to maximise the benefit of hosting these games, but everyone has a role to play. Legacy is a responsibility of many parts of government. Before the games, I wrote to my colleagues to highlight the important role they play in sustaining that legacy in the years ahead. Post-games, structures are being established to deliver on our long-term commitments, embedding legacy aspirations into existing policy structures. Achievements to date have been made possible by the partnership working of a whole host of organisations and committed individuals, all working with a common purpose. National partners have been struck by the benefits of a collective approach to legacy, achieving more by working together, and we'll capture the learning from this and use that going forward for legacy and other major events, starting with the year of food and drink next year. Local authorities are an essential link in the chain in spreading the benefits of these games across the whole of Scotland. The Solace Legacy Leads Group is meeting again soon, and I welcome their continued support. There are a number of areas where there are clear opportunities to strengthen this legacy. First, the sporting legacy. Sport Scotland will continue to drive forward its world-class sporting system, which has already delivered for us so spectacularly. Let us not forget also the delivery uh, for schools, communities and sports clubs on a daily basis. And of course, an immediate benefit exists in the form of the sports equipment from the Games, including uh, items of rugby balls and tennis table tennis tables, which will be distributed to clubs, schools and local authorities across Scotland. A long-term population-wide shift in sports participation and activity levels, however, is not an automatic outcome from hosting a major sporting event. 
The Physical Activity Implementation Plan was launched earlier this year and takes a long-term approach to tackling inactivity, building on the internationally renowned Toronto Charter. I look forward to working with partners to ensure that we deliver on our commitment to increase sports participation and physical activity levels, regardless of age or background, as a lasting legacy from these Games. We're in a good place, but we've got to keep going, and that's why I'm pleased to confirm today that we're continuing with the £2 million of legacy funding next year to maintain momentum and continue to capitalise on the inspiration provided by these Games. There can be no doubt that the Games have been a strong catalyst for regeneration in the east end of Glasgow and South Lanarkshire. However, long-term success will only be achieved if communities are at the heart of regeneration and if the support is in place to reduce unemployment before the Games is continued and strengthened uh, after uh, the Games. Recognising this, the Scottish Government and partners, Glasgow City Council, South Lanarkshire Council and Clyde Gateway have reaffirmed a collective commitment to the regeneration of the area to ensure an enduring legacy. There are also plans in place to work with Scottish businesses to grow Scotland's role in the global events sector at home and overseas. Events are one of Scotland's biggest assets and we must capitalise on the venues, the infrastructure, the business, the volunteering and skills base which have been developed. And a new national event strategy will be published after the events of 2014, capitalising on what we have learned. Central to the success of the Games has undoubtedly been our 15,000 Clydesiders and we are working closely with Volunteer Scotland and others on a new initiative which will harness the enthusiasm of those who were successful and those who were not, matching their interests and skills to other exciting volunteering opportunities beyond the Games. And finally, young people deserve a special mention. They have been at the heart of legacy and are key to sustaining legacy beyond the Games. I, along with 19,000 others, had the pleasure of visiting the Youth Legacy Ambassadors at Glasgow Green at their flourishing Scotland Live site, where seed balls and wishes will form part of a wider regeneration effort to bring stalled spaces back to life. I am pleased that Young Scott will, in a matter of weeks, offer young people the platform to co-design future leg legacy activity beyond this year. This will build on the insights of the 150 Youth Legacy Ambassadors as well as other young people involved in a wide range of legacy programmes which focus on youth. The Year of Young People in Scotland in 2018 provides a pathway to build on the legacy from these Games. The opening ceremony marked a first by raising £5 million for UNICEF and as a charitable partner of the Games, UNICEF will use these funds to realise their ambition of reaching every child in Scotland over the next four years, as well as helping children across the Commonwealth. And part of this legacy in Scotland focuses on children's rights. And I was delighted to receive a preview, along with pupils from Blackfriars Primary School in Glasgow, of the Child Rights Launchpad. That's going to uh, be provided free to schools, communities and sports groups and youth clubs throughout Scotland. And I believe will make a, a huge difference uh, to children's lives. The legacy that has been created by Scottish Government, Glasgow City Council and partners is sparking interest further afield. The Commonwealth Games Federation has already hailed it as a blueprint for the future, which was very complimentary. We are now engaged in learning lessons and the transfer of knowledge most directly to our friends in Queensland for the Gold Coast 2018, but also for the CGF itself uh, in its plans to build legacy more explicitly into the bid requirements for future games, and that's something we would certainly uh, welcome. Presiding officer, in the years to come, the 2014 Commonwealth Games will not only be remembered as the biggest cultural and sporting event Scotland has ever seen, they will also be remembered for their legacy, a legacy which has grown and evolved, providing other countries with a benchmark, showing what can be delivered when you put people and a nation's well-being at the heart of a major international event. I note the amendments uh, made by Patricia Ferguson and Liz Smith, and I'm happy to accept them in full in the spirit of uh, cooperation. Um, and uh, and uh, I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Patricia Ferguson to speak to and to move Amendment 10736.2. Ten minutes, please, Ms Ferguson. 
Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Can I say in opening that I'm delighted with the announcement the Cabinet Secretary has made today about the facility in Largs. As she knows, um, I've had a keen interest in uh, disability sport for a long time now, and I think it is entirely fitting that we take this step, building on what happened at the Commonwealth Games and recognising that while parasport has always been integrated into the Commonwealth Games, it has never been integrated quite to the extent that it has been on this occasion. But I think it's interesting, presiding officer, that from ScotRail renaming stations like Springburn to the witty and games appropriate Sprintburn, or to the millions of people who bought tickets for the games or watched on TV, it seemed to me as though almost everyone was in on the biggest party Glasgow has ever thrown. And it wasn't just Glaswegians who were involved with athletes from around the world, games venues in Edinburgh, Lanarkshire and Angus, and volunteers from around the UK and beyond. And I'll perhaps say a little more about the volunteers in my closing remarks. A quick glance at social media in the evenings helped to tell me which of my relatives and friends were in town for the games and which cousins were coming back to Glasgow from around the UK to watch the games. But I think the prize for distance travelled in my own family goes to a cousin who came from Tasmania to watch his two sports, judo and triathlon, and couldn't believe the transformation in the city of his birth. Given that he's the same age as me, I must admit that he put me rather to shame, but we can but aspire to do better. But of course, it all really began with the baton relay. The relay was always going to be important in my own constituency because alone of all the sectors of the city, the north was the only one that didn't really have a games venue, something that I regret. But the baton relay was the main opportunity for communities in the north to join in the fun and the excitement and join in, they certainly did. People lined the route wherever the baton went and I think special praise must go to Depot Arts in Postal Park who really went to town with a programme of activities second to none. And the 8,000 people who turned up at Springburn Park to witness the final event of the day's baton relay also embraced the event with real enthusiasm and we enjoyed music and sunshine for several hours before the baton arrived. And of course the opening ceremony was just the kind of event that was needed with enough, just enough pomp to mark the beginning of the games and plenty of Glasgow humour, self-mocking and joyous, allowing everyone to join in. I think the sight of dancing tea cakes will probably stick with me forever, although I probably won't eat very many in the future. And there's much about that night that is memorable with all the performers deserving praise. And no, I don't have a habit of eating them at the moment, but that's neither here nor there. But with all the performers really deserving our praise, I, I think that for me, the joy in Nicola Benedetti's face as she played and the marvellous voice of Pumeza singing one of my favourite songs, together with the wonderful dancers from Scottish Ballet, will be remembered for a long time. And the volunteers who danced their hearts out for more than two hours were simply great. Now, I was at the opening ceremony, but I was rather far from the field of play, so I missed the fact that John Mar Barman had kissed another male performer. But when I heard about it, that just gave me an excuse to watch the ceremony again. And well done to John Barman and to whoever came up with the idea of making such an important point without a lecture being delivered or a word uttered. I think that truly is part of the legacy of these games. And Scottish Labour's amendment also makes reference to the UNICEF initiative that raised £5 million from the audience and reminded us during the evening how difficult life can be from, for some of the children at home and further afield. And I hope that it might become a feature of other multi-sport events or other sports events in the future. And then, of course, the Games began with every last one of our athletes, indeed all the athletes who participated, being remarkable and many of them overcoming great adversity in life to participate. And of course, the spectators cheered on the home athletes with great gusto and enthusiasm, but cheered on other countries too, and that was a joy to see. I have a feeling that if the bid for Glasgow to host the 2018 Youth Olympics had been made after the Commonwealth Games and not before, the outcome might have been influenced in a good way uh, for Gla in Glasgow's favour. And our medal hall began on day one with the amazing Aileen McGlynn and her pilot Louise Haston adding silver to Aileen's already impressive Olympic and Commonwealth Games medal tally. And the Rennick sisters in judo leading a medal rush in their sport. The fantastic achievement of Hannah Miley in the pool began a games that culminated, as we know, 
in Scotland placed fourth in the medal table with new records against the names of many of our athletes and our largest ever medal hall at a Commonwealth Games. We witnessed some amazing performances throughout the Games. I'm not going to mention them here because time doesn't allow, but they were truly remarkable in that regard. And there isn't time either to mention every Scots athlete who won a medal. But actually, that's something to be proud of. So I will simply say, well done to all of them and to their coaches and their families who support them throughout the year. So the Games began in glorious sunshine, but all too soon the weather deteriorated and we were faced with a downpour of almost monsoon-like proportions. But still the spectators came, with 120,000 of us lining the streets of Glasgow in the worst of weather to cheer on those brave enough to compete in those conditions. And all too soon the Games were over and now we must consider their legacy. So what will that legacy be? And how do we harness the enthusiasm that there is for sport in our country as a result? Now, I have to say that going right back in the history of these games, before a decision was even made that we should bid, one of the assessments that was done, and the most serious assessment that was done, was about whether or not it is possible to secure a legacy from an event such as this. The result of that study, which took the best part of a year, was that there could be, but that it had to be planned and programmed in from the very beginning if it could be realised. So it's important that we remember that that was always part of the plan. Indeed, I think it was actually a key decider in the bid for Glasgow being successful. And we know that we've witnessed regeneration in the East End of Glasgow in terms of regeneration and infrastructure. The Athletes' Village will provide new affordable homes as well as houses for rent. And the tourism sector in the city has enjoyed a boom and is likely to be able to capitalise on return visits for some time to come. Hopefully that too will result in more jobs with decent pay and good working conditions attached. But unemployment in the east end of Glasgow, as in several other parts of the city, including my own constituency, remains stubbornly high. And there are legacy programmes to try to counter that. And I would particularly single out the apprenticeship programme that's been operating in Glasgow at a cost of over £50 million for some time now. I've certainly met a number of young people who've successfully applied and become apprentices on that scheme. And to say it's made a difference to their lives and their life opportunities is not to exaggerate at all. But a recent survey carried out for the City Council revealed that some two-thirds of those in the sample cohort in the East End who were out of work, reported that they had long-standing illness, disability or infirmity. So how do we improve the health record of Glasgow and Scotland and can that too be a legacy of the Games? In my own view, encouraging young people to walk or cycle to school would be a start, with more encouragement given to people who walk or cycle regularly. And if we have to start somewhere, it seems to me that we could start there. These are not... Uh, activities that require a great deal of infrastructure, they just need encouragement and the get-go to do it. And what a sport itself. I think that's perhaps the most interesting and possibly even the most challenging aspect of legacy. In an article in the Herald this week, Doug Gillen, who has covered um, at least 11 Commonwealth Games by my reckoning, makes the point that there should be a process of debriefing, learning what worked and being honest about what didn't and that we should look at how and what we fund in sport too. Doug Gillen suggests that this analysis should be done independently, that it shouldn't be done by the Institute or Sport Scotland, praiseworthy though they both are, that it should be done independently to ensure its rigour. And I think he has a point. We know that we performed particularly well in some sports and perhaps didn't perform to capacity in others. And we need to look at that and be honest with ourselves and with the athletes about, that, about why that occurred. We also, if we look forward to the Gold Coast, as the Minister has urged us to do, have to think about the fact that all the home nations, England and Wales, I think with the exception of Northern Ireland, did better in these games than they have ever done before, like Scotland. And we have to wonder whether or not we'll be able to achieve those kinds of results in the Gold Coast. I hope we will, but we have to start preparing seriously now to do that. And before much more time passes, we need to harness to the enthusiasm that was so evident during the games to encourage the entire country to become more active more often. In my view, some kind of event to mark 
the end of the Games and to encourage momentum might have been a good way to do it at some point, perhaps during this or next week. And it may be that the Athletes Parade in Glasgow on the 15th of August would be a fitting moment to show that that momentum will continue and that the impetus is still there. Because the Games might be over, but their legacy must live on. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move amendment 10736.1. Six minutes, please, Ms. Smith. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And uh, could I begin by reiterating our congratulations to all those who helped to make the Commonwealth Games such a successful and indeed memorable event, whether it was our outstanding athletes, the numerous officials and administrators, the volunteers, the Scottish and UK governments, Glasgow City Council, the police, the armed forces, they all deserve glowing praise for the excellent work that they did. Over the 11 days, I think we witnessed competition of the very highest order, and so we were perhaps not surprised to hear Mike Hooper, the chief executive of the Commonwealth Games Federation, tell us that they were the standout games in the history of the movement. That's a very considerable uh, compliment. And in that vein, we have absolutely uh, no problem in supporting the main motion and indeed the uh, Labour amendment. And we also welcome the announcement that the Minister uh, has made regarding LARGs. Now, I don't think anybody uh, could doubt the extent of the challenge that we actually face when it comes to the uh, delivery of a meaningful and lasting legacy. And I say that because I, I don't think it's easy to actually define the parameters of the debate. The word legacy in itself is not actually terribly easy to define, particularly in its qualitative sense, and therefore I don't actually think it's particularly easy uh, to measure. And that's in some uh, games in the past, that's been a reason why people have perhaps uh, moved away uh, from the issue. While it must, by necessity, include some aspects of quantitative measure, for example, uh, increasing the number of people who are participating in sport and uh, taking on board the Scottish Government's initiative to try to ensure that more women uh, take up sport, uh, obviously you can measure the reductions in obesity totals or how much additional uh, money is raised. Uh, but the legacy, I think, has to be much more than that. And I think that's the tougher call. Indeed, I'm not entirely sure that it is the politician's job uh, to say what that should be. Uh, but what I think is our job and what we have to do in line with the other stakeholders, uh, such as Sports Scotland and Glasgow 2014, local authorities, etc., is to deliver the right circumstances which will help communities to develop the more qualitative aspects of the legacy. I think it was Stuart Harris who said that it's all about building capacity, and I think he's absolutely uh, right in that. Thus, it is not enough to provide top-class facilities in sport. At a recent meeting of the Cross-Party Sport Group, we heard that 50% of the senior schools uh, in Scotland now have excellent sports facilities, and we've all seen uh, many of them. But at times, quite a lot of them are still underused. And what's important, and I think the uh, Cabinet Secretary referred to this in the context of uh, LARGs, is that we have to change the public uh, perception and change the culture and the attitudes to ensure that there is participation and development. The Games obviously revealed some inspirational examples which can facilitate such a shift in that perspective. The extraordinary achievement of England's Steve Way, who in uh, 2007, I think he said on television that he weighed 16 and a half stone and smoked 20 cigarettes a day, but at Glasgow 2014 he finished 10th in the marathon, breaking the British over 40s record, which had stood since 1979. And I think Way's transformation shows the ability of sport to change lives as sufficient determination is there. Or who can forget the delightful Erid Davis, the 13-year-old Shetland swimmer who won bronze in the 100-metre para breaststroke, showed just how much can be done with even modest means. I'm sure uh, our colleague uh, Tavish Scott, who I know is here, will say a little bit more about this, but she trains uh, in Bray in a pool that I think is about a third of the length of the one in which she won uh, her medal. And she uh, has proved just what can be done without necessarily having world-class facilities in which to train. And when she was interviewed, she spoke about her inspiration at primary school. And if I may, I want to focus on the Conservative amendment for this, which makes a statement about the, the crucial role that I believe primary schools ha uh, will have if they have to deliver the legacy in full. Uh, as I understand it, Cabinet Secretary, I think there's been very significant uh, progress in recent months about the uh, meeting of the PE targets in schools and I know that Sports Scotland has worked very hard with Education uh, Scotland to support the PE CPD uh, programme which will ensure that much more is done to tackle the uh, shortfall in primary teachers who are fully qualified in PE and in sport. Uh, and Sports Scotland at a recent session of the Health and Sport Committee made it very clear that the issue is much more about the 
uh, quality of that delivery and the, uh, that rather than just the amount. And I would suggest, Cabinet Secretary, I think we need to do a little bit more to ensure that local authorities do actually know exactly what is going on in their schools, because a recent FOI response uh, suggested there was a rather uh, worrying number of them who didn't actually seem to know what the situation was in their schools, how many teachers were fully uh, trained, etc. So I think it would be helpful, Cabinet Secretary, if you give us a little bit of information about when you expect to be able to update that kind of data uh, and uh, just how we can move forward from that. What the uh, Games have also proved is Scotland's uh, depth of sporting interest and ability, something which I uh, know was always very dear to the heart of the late Margaret MacDonald uh, as she chaired the cross-party sport group. We may be a football-mad uh, nation from time to time, but I think these Games have proved just what else we can do in the so-called minority sports. Three goals in the bronze and lawn bowls, a remarkable 13 medals in judo, and I just uh, noticed uh, yesterday that the squash and netball uh, figures are both shot up in terms of the rankings of spectator sport. And I think uh, that there's an interest there about the broadcasting of sport, uh, and that was something that, all credit to the BBC actually, uh, who uh, managed to develop a lot of these minority sports to a level uh, that we hadn't seen before. And I think the lessons about broadcasting are something that we can uh, develop in the future. Uh, I'm running uh, out of time, but I, I do want to say that I think this legacy uh, has to run deep. It is about some of the difficult concepts, but nonetheless, these are the most important ones if we are to provide what will be a meaningful and a lasting legacy. So I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. We now come to the open debate speeches of six minutes, please. And I call Sandra White to be followed by Drew Smith. Thank you very much, President Officer. I'm looking forward to a very animated uh, debate, I hope. And can I just start by saying uh, and giving an absolutely big warm thank you to everyone who took part in the Games, from the athletes to the volunteers, the transport workers, the council workers, and of course the people of Glasgow and of Scotland, who made it truly the People's Games. That's certainly the word I was hearing throughout the Games. This is the People's Games. And I do believe that that's the legacy these Games have given to the rest of the world and it's resonating throughout Glasgow. I think we're a bit shell-shocked. It's not still going on, obviously. Uh, some people are quite happy that uh, they can go on the bus now and get their cars out, but the vast majority of people are saying, what's happened? We're so busy, and uh, we're looking forward to anything else that comes forward to Glasgow. I have to say, and, and uh, perhaps a... Uh, an interest here as being a member of the Executive Committee of the CP in the Scottish Parliament, I really was very proud, and I'm glad that Patricia Fergan has put it in her motion, proud of the fact that the organisers of the Games took it upon them to use the initiative uh, to raise money through UNICEF uh, for the benefit of the children of the Commonwealth. Uh, I think it's a truly unique idea, and uh, it shows the spirit of Glasgow and the people of Scotland and the humanity that is there, and very proud of that part that was put forward. And I do want to echo Lord Smith of Kelvin, uh, the Scotland 2014 chair, uh, when he said that uh, Glasgow's connections with the common, uh, Commonwealth are centuries old and they run deep. They tell a story of industry and enterprise on a global scale. These connections have been strengthened and whilst the Games may leave Glasgow, Glasgow will never forget the Commonwealth Games. It's made its mark in our city and it's won a place in our hearts. This is a city that dares to dream a city defined by its people, a city which looks out for each other, a welcoming city. And I think that's very, very true. And I'll, perhaps I'll come back to some of the kind of personal experiences I had throughout and that will continue our connections with the Commonwealth after September the 18th this year. I mentioned the fact about the initiative and how proud I was, and I'm also very proud and thankful for the Minister for her announcement of the Paris Sports Centre based in Largs. The first in the UK, uh, I think this is absolutely great news, and uh, it you know, fits in with the legacy of humanity, equality and destiny. And I also must mention and congratulate Glasgow College, who had graduates, six graduates in Team Scotland, including Kimberly Rennix, who won the very first gold medal of the Games, and Liam Davy, whose team actually claimed the very first medal for Team Gymnasts. And the reason I raise this is I think it surely bodes very well for our colleges and what they can achieve, and it bodes well for the future of our gymnasts and our athletes in our colleges, and I think we have to uh, remember that. Now, I do want to share some of my fantastic personal experiences from the transport uh, workers' point of view, and 
I remember getting on the bus because obviously we were still working during the games as well and living in the Merchant City, I couldn't get a car out so I would walk or I would jump the bus and I must admit everyone was so happy. We had to stand going from the city centre, coming out from the city centre but it was just an absolutely happy uh, atmosphere. And uh, the drivers on, on the first bus uh, really took it to their hearts. They would go off the bus to take people off with prams. They would go off the bus to take people off with wheelchairs. And I was saying to the, the cab sec uh, earlier on when I came in that uh, one particular driver, I'm sure he'll, he'll know who he is if he reads this, uh, was uh, so enthusiastic when people got on from Kelvin Grove with the, you know, their passes and they perhaps had a pass that said they were going to the wrestling or the judo and they were you know, over 50 years of age, put it that way. The driver would make a remark and saying, surely to goodness you're not going to go wrestling or anything. And everybody, everybody took it in absolutely fantastic spirits and that was the way it was throughout the whole of the games. I've also got to thank the Glasgow City Council workers who kept the city absolutely spotlessly clean. They worked 24 hours a day constantly all the time and I think it was great in the closing ceremony to see them come out and be awarded by the song obviously Destiny as, as, as they were singing it by Deacon Blue uh, and I thought that was a really good touch because they worked so hard and as I say living in the Merchant City and uh, travelling throughout the, the Kelvin where there was lots and lots of things going on in my constituency uh, it was spotlessly clean and they kept the whole thing going all the time there's so many people obviously the volunteers as well but I think uh, and the police as well I, I saw a couple of policemen doing a dance in Argyle Street joining in with uh, we had a 1920s, 40s uh, one afternoon in, in Argyle Street and they were having a great time and I'm sure I think everyone else probably saw it, it was on YouTube and, uh, as well as I thought they did a great job as well but the everyday people apart from the, obviously the volunteers but the everyday people in Glasgow were absolutely fantastic they helped people they gave them directions even if they didn't want to go they told them they were going but in Glasgow we we're pretty famous for that telling people well if you want to go there we'll take you but maybe we don't want to go for another hour but we'll take you just now anyway so it was absolutely fantastic in that they gave them a history of Glasgow I was with a, a couple of Australians we were up at the necropolis and people were giving them a history of the necropolis and the great thing was that every single one of them said we didn't, we'd never visited Glasgow or parts of Scotland before, perhaps the Highlands, but nothing in a city centre. And they were definitely going to come back because there's so much going on. They were so enthused that they wanted to come back. And I think uh, in concluding, presiding officer, we've got to thank the staff who ran the hotels, the pubs, the clubs and the restaurants. They really run these places absolutely fantastically. I hope they got the, you know, the salaries that they deserved because they certainly did work very, very hard around the clock with a smile on their face. And all in all, I think the legacy that's been left to the rest of Scotland and, and the world is that Glasgow is a great place that we are always welcome to come and visit. Thank you. Thank you. And I call on Drew Smith to be followed by John Mason. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. It's a pleasure to take uh, part in this debate and to uh, follow um, the enthusiasm of, of Sandra White. And I, I would begin by um, echoing some of those uh, thank yous um, as well to the, the, the Minister. Obviously, um, I couldn't have thought of a, a, of a better highlight of that last weekend than the one that she was able to enjoy on all of her behalf in presenting the medals uh, after the, the, the men's road race at, at Glasgow Green to the, the city councils and all the, the, to the city council, all the partners, the organising committee, all of the various officials and different organisations, um, to the media, Kenny Stewart, I don't know who's uh, in the gallery, our parliamentary link, I think we'll all miss. Um, your email invitations to uh, pose with a giant inflatable shoe or high five with, uh, with Clyde um, or put our hard, hard hats on, uh, on a venue tour, the volunteers, including uh, Patricia Ferguson and I know uh, John Mason also. I think it says a lot about, um, about Patricia Ferguson that she volunteered her time in the back rooms at Glasgow after being uh, part of the successful bid uh, and indeed presenting medals herself uh, in Melbourne. And our amendment makes reference uh, to the thousands of ordinary people who gave up their time to, to do the same. And I agree that we do need to think about how we follow up their, super, their superb contribution. Uh, many of those that I met did come from all over Scotland, all over the UK, uh, and many of them had been uh, volunteers at Manchester and in London, and it's clear that, that there's a momentum there that will keep going. Um, there are too many people to mention. Um, Sandra White gave it um, a good shot. I would agree with her. The bus drivers uh, who took us uh, to and from the venues, the bus marshals who were losing their voices trying to get us on the buses, the trains and taxi drivers, the police, 
uh, the men and women who brought their Scotty dogs to the opening ceremony, the women in George, the George Square ticket office uh, helped me on the morning of the opening ceremony to get uh, my tickets. The City Parks Department, who made sure that the city looked its best and that every public space in the, in the centre of uh, Glasgow was decked with flowers. But the event, of course, was about athletes, and that's our biggest thank you to them, the teams that support them, um, for putting on the show from all over the Commonwealth, from the home nations, and, of course, Team Scotland, who did us proud with, as the Minister says, a record haul of medals. Now, I think the success of, the, of these games was measured against the expectations and the preparations that were made for them. And I don't think, I certainly, I, I don't think that I ever doubted that Glasgow would deliver. So I wasn't surprised uh, and I don't feel overawed by the best games ever. I think Glaswegians knew that our city would shine um, in this moment, whether it was in the sun or in the rain. And the people of Glasgow, gallus and generous as they are, I think made these games. Uh, and I think regardless of our, our parties, all of us have got the privilege to, to represent the city are rightly uh, proud to do so. Um, this summer. I think, President Officer, uh, politics and sport do have a curious relationship, so I think it was right that we sought to protect uh, the competitors from being, being asked their views about the referendum every turn. Um, but it is the case that the Games happened because political leaders got behind sporting visionaries in bringing them to Glasgow. And a lasting legacy, something that is often talked about with major sporting events, but you know, which is rarely de delivered, um, will only come if we, um, politicians, back up those volunteers in our sports clubs and support our least active, citizen, active citizens to make uh, their own way to healthier lives. The backup and, and frankly, the money um, comes because of political decisions. So the games were not about politics, but the legacy now is all about politics. My constituents in East End and across Glasgow who feared the games uh, would be uh, something happening to other people. Um, they're now looking to us, to the Scottish Government, but to all of us um, to deliver on the promises um, that, were, that were made. And those of us who supported the games coming and thought um, through the planning knew that there were cynics out there who were unconvinced that this would be money well spent or that it would be worth um, the disruption. And it was the vision of the legacy, um, as much as the success of the sport, which ensured um, that public support was so high when the Games opened. Um, and we really do have a responsibility not to let those people down now. So I would welcome every announcement the Minister uh, has made and every uh, programme uh, that she's supporting. Um, but I think the political determination to change lives and to raise our eyes must be sustained uh, beyond the athletes uh, parade, and I don't doubt that, that the Minister shares that. Um, physical activity, presiding officer, is Scotland's single biggest public health challenge, and encouraging participation in sport from the youngest age is a huge part of the solution. Children need the opportunities to uh, try and like or dislike as many sports as possible till they find something uh, that might be part of their life forever. And physical li literacy is key. Skills not just for games or for sport, but for living a fuller life, running, jumping, swimming, throwing and catching. Confidence at these basics provides us with the ability to return to activity at any time in our lives, regardless of fitness levels or our commitment to competitive sport. So in the days uh, following the Games, I was pleased to see Scottish Swimming have been uh, promoting their Every Child Can Swim campaign, which I feel very strongly about. Swimming is too often missed when we talk about physical literacy, and I would say, as some of the um, Team Scotland medalists who have, have been doing so in an online video this week, that swimming is also a life skill. Um, uh, you know, we do uh, obviously live in an island, but we also live in a country where um, too many children are still seriously injured uh, as a result uh, of accidents and drownings in open waterways. So in my view, that would be one uh, example of where a fitting legacy would be for a long-term commitment to teach all of our children to swim for enjoyment, for fitness, for sport, um, but also because it's the potential to get them out of danger. Like riding a bike, learning to swim is something that never leaves us, and it's the perfect activity as we get older and our ability to exercise vigorously um, does decrease. Um, walking was rightly mentioned by Patricia Ferguson as well as, uh, as being promoted as an activity for those who are currently least active um, uh, and wish to improve their mobility, their fitness or their health. And, and it has been described as the, uh, as the best prescription for a healthier life. Um, so I would also uh, uh, hope and expect that the Minister will, will continue her encouragement um, for these uh, forms of activity. Um, in a way which I think can promote lifelong activity um, by, by giving children the skills at the youngest age to have skills and activity that they can then go back to um, in life, but also to provide those entry-level activities that can be gateways for people taking up activity later in life. Um, I don't really have time uh, at this stage now to go into all the, the issues about um, facilities, presiding officer, and, and uh, I won't. Um, I think they're uh, fantastic, and notwithstanding what Liz Smith uh, said about uh, swimming pools, which I absolutely um, agree with, she's, she's perfectly correct, it's, it's amazing things that can be achieved without facilities. I don't doubt that there was 
the increased availability we've seen over the years of things like 50 metre pools across the country did help us with, um, with the, the, uh, the success that, that we supported Scottish swimming um, to in uh, Toll Cross. Just finally, President Officer, I would ask, I hope that the Minister would maybe consider this would be a debate that we could come back to and uh, maybe on an annual basis in the remaining, uh, the remaining period of this Parliament so that we can all continue to play a part in the legacy of these games. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, the first two opening speakers have run slightly over. I'm afraid I don't have a lot of time in the debate, so I would ask members to keep to their six minutes, please. John Mason to be followed by John Pentland. Hey, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And firstly, I would want to add my voice to say I consider the Games to have been uh, such a huge success. I don't know if I, it's my personal uh, make-up that I don't always share uh, quite as much confidence as Drew Smith uh, ha has just told us that he was confident everything would work. Because I did wonder... I did wonder, could we fill the venues for some of these minor sports? What would the weather be like? Would some external event come along and that could disrupt the Games? Eh, or even, eh, I wondered if it was wise to have the Thanksgiving service in the Cathedral actually before the Games had happened. But I'm glad to say that eh, all of these eh, concerns were proved unfounded and things clearly eh, went extremely well. Now, I could list a range of things which we could have done better, and I'll, I want to mention one, of these two, one or two of these as we go through. But I think we have to keep anything like that in perspective. The Games were enormously successful, and hiccups or blips are always going to happen eh, along the way. But we need to remember they are just that, eh, pretty minor issues in the scheme of things. Now, specifically on legacy, one of the biggest parts of that has to be the ability, the experience, and now the confidence it, to run such large events in both Glasgow and in Scotland. And that is linked, I believe, to the image of Glasgow and Scotland in the wider world. Now, this is a process that has been going on for quite some time. It, we had the City of Culture in the past, we had the Garden Festival, we had the Champions League final, all of these. And we want that process to continue now that we've shown what we can do. Would we do things differently in the future? Of course, we always want to be learning and doing things better. For example, was the 90 million for security a bit over the top? We had a lot of police, a lot of military, a lot of private security personnel. Were there too many? Now, I guess that is a question that there can never be a right answer to. We had a lot of high-profile uh, individuals, and some of them potentially unpopular individuals, uh, in the city attending the Games, and something could have gone wrong. So I'm very grateful indeed that nothing did go wrong. Uh, for example, I was working in, in the Hydro at gymnastics at one stage when members of the royal family uh, came in, watched the sport, uh, later left. Uh, and that seemed to be handled in a very appropriate, low-key, relaxed kind of way, albeit I'm sure there was more going on behind the scenes. Moving on to volunteering, uh, which I know that Patricia Ferguson and I both uh, took part in. I don't know if we were representatives of the parliament, but we'd like to think we were. Uh, I really enjoyed the experience, and my duties included things like checking people's tickets, guiding folk around the hydro, and using a megaphone and large green foam hand in Finison Street, uh, directing spectators to their events. And there was a certain feeling of power, which uh, I now understand what you have, presiding officer. Uh, very quickly, yes. Bob Torres. Mr Torres, can we have your microphone up? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can, uh, presiding officer, can I thank the member for high-fiving me with a large green foam hand? Uh, at Finiston on the way to the women's weightlifting finals. I think Mr Mason did an excellent job. John Mason. Hey, thank you. I thank Mr Doris for that uh, compliment. Uh, there were some trickier tasks along the way. For example, with the one-way system at the SECC, people had to leave over the Bells Bridge, and frankly, not everybody was very happy about that. Uh, on, by contrast, one of the most pleasant experiences I had was last Saturday morning, when some of the boxing fans were being told that they were getting their tickets upgraded. And to see people's faces when you told them, which was my job, eh, that they were getting a better ticket, it was absolutely magic. Eh, on the Clyde Siders, it will be interesting to see in due course an analysis of all those who took part. Were they a cross-section of the whole of society? Now, I was only in one part of the team, which was spectator services at SECC, although it was quite a large team. A lot of them were young, which is perhaps not surprising, especially given the physical nature of a lot of the work, and I think both Patricia Ferguson and myself uh, found our ages a challenge uh, when it came to some of the work. Uh, the advantage uh, of having a lot... Oops. Oops. Uh, the advantage of having a lot of young people was certainly the level of enthusiasm and energy uh, which we had. And I could see that some of the... Some of the... Oh, yes, on you go. Patricia Ferguson. 
Um, I can assure the member that while I might have been a little bit tired after a nine-hour shift on occasion, I didn't feel the, the um, work was too difficult or too hard. But then again, I didn't have the responsibility of the foam finger. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for that uh, intervention. Um, the, it, was, it was good seeing some of the younger folk who were team leaders and te some of the temporary paid staff who were also quite young, really gaining, obviously gaining valuable experience in decision making and leadership skills. However, the volunteers uh, in, the, in the kind of team where I work did seem to be very white and did seem to be very female. And I wonder if a uh, folk too from, uh, it was mainly folk from better off backgrounds. One Clydesider told me from down south that it cost him £2,000 uh, to take part. Although obviously for local folk, uh, there was virtually no cost in that. It was good having volunteers from all over uh, different parts, uh, not just of the UK, but even beyond. Uh, although some of them clearly uh, suffered from lack of local knowledge. One evening, the train stopped running at Exhibition Centre Station, and we were asked to explain to people how they could get home. Uh, now, that uh, could be challenging for folk who did not know where the city centre is or where they could catch a number two bus. Uh, so maybe we do need to think, too, about the local knowledge of volunteers in the future. Now, I've mentioned so far the legacy of our ability to run such events and the volunteering legacy, which I hope can continue. And the third and final one I would want to touch on would be the physical local legacy, uh, which... Uh, and I'm sure others will talk about other issues too. But for my constituents and myself, we have something very real and very physical. We have the Games Village now becoming 700 new homes, social rented, bought care home. We have the Emirates Arena and Velodrome for a whole range of major and minor sports. We have the improved Toe Cross Pool, which allows both serious and leisure swimmers. We have the Scottish Hockey Centre, and I do hope that sport can be spread out amongst more young people and more schools. And of course, we have the great infrastructure now with roads like uh, the Clyde Gateway, which they themselves uh, have helped regenerate to bring business and jobs into the area. So can I say on behalf of Glasgow Shettleston constituency that we are very grateful for all the investment there has been. Uh, sure, both residents and businesses have been disrupted and in some cases quite severely disrupted. However, the long term benefit is hard to argue against. There is more to be done, but we have been given a superb lift up in order to get on with the job. Thank you. Thank you. I call John Pentland to be followed by James Dornan, and we do have to keep strictly to six minutes, please. The uh, presiding officer, like others, uh, I think it's really important to recognise that the organisational and sporting successes of the Commonwealth Games have been a product of the efforts of many people working together enthusiastically and inclusively. Mr Pentland, could you put your microphone round slightly? Thank you. Maximising the benefits that are delivered as a result of the Games will also be dependent upon harnessing that energy and the commitment and the spirit of cooperation. And like me, I'm sure everybody knows somebody who knows someone from somewhere who made these Games pure, dead, brilliant and the best ever. Now, there's not enough, to thank, not enough time to thank all the sports people, parliamentarians, councillors and officials who were involved with the bid instigated in 2006, for everyone involved in the planning and development of the Games in Glasgow City Council, the excellent hosts, North Lancashire Council for the Triathlon at Strathclyde Park, which was immaculate and fantastic, and where the first medal of the Games was awarded, and to North Lancashire Leisure, who provided the training facilities at Ravenscraig's Regional Sports Centre. And I congratulate all our competitors and medal winners who deserve all the praise that has been heaped upon them for their dedication and for making the Games compulsive viewing, especially for a couch potato like myself. And I can assure you that's about to change. And what a delight it was to see the gold medal won by Wisher Postman and lightweight boxer Charlie Flynn. And like many others, I shared the surprise when the judges decided that Mother was Reese McFadden who should have been on his way to gold, would have to settle for a bronze instead. And last, but definitely not least, my thanks to the volunteers who all did such a magnificent job, and to everyone who worked with the national teams, who helped at events, and were out and about helping the public make the most of the Games. We are, all, we are, of course, hoping that all the success added to the experience of those who visited and those who watched throughout the world will have a lasting legacy. And like the Minister said, you know, there are good reasons to hope that this you know, will be the case, not least 
is the way in which the Commonwealth Games themselves took advantage of the Olympics that preceded them in London. That helped with the development of facilities and the performance of sports people throughout the UK. North Lanarkshire's facilities, by the way, will hopefully bring the British Transplant Games in 2017 and 2017. And I'm sure the Parliament, along with myself, uh, will wish the Council every success in that bid. Now, many of the sports are, of course, supported at UK level with UK-wide facilities, and there is tremendous UK cooperation and camaraderie in all sports. The Olympics provided the, te the template and the platform, and this was utilised in the planning of the Glasgow 2014, and it encouraged the growth of public interest in the wide range of sports. These really were the friendly games, as all competitors were given great support and all visitors warmly welcomed. And that was often especially true to the supposed old enemy, with English athletes being rousingly cheered to victory. And what we have to do now is to take the combined achievements of the UK and its nations, competing together and in a friendly rivalry, and to build on that to take Scottish and UK sport to the next level. The Commonwealth Games legacy for Scotland will exist at many levels, and they are the obvious and often highlighted economic aspects such as regeneration, tourism and international trade. There are the benefits for sport and the consequences for that for better health. Some are not so obvious, such as boosting social capital. You know, this is one part of the legacy that has to be harnessed, not tomorrow, not next week, or after the referendum, but immediately. And some of the volunteers will already be involved in various forms of activity. But for others who I heard talking about it, it was an invigorating first new experience. Now, I welcome Scotland's best initiative being open to young Clyde Siders, but we also need to channel the tremendous energy and commitment of Clyde Siders into other areas, into their communities, into the voluntary sector, and into civic activity. But these benefits just won't happen, or at least they won't be maximised, without a concerted effort to, to promote and sustain them. Now, the lottery is spending £15 million on games-related funding, but the opportunities to, accept, to access this are coming to an end. So what is going to be done to match the volunteers with further opportunities? The next few months will be, crucial, will be a crucial time during which we can build on the success of the Commonwealth Games. And, President Officer, the Scottish Government has the power to do that and needs to use that power. And hopefully, the result of the referendum will allow us to concentrate on developing the benefits of working together within Scottish and UK sport and within our communities to further the spirit of the Games. Thank you. Thank you. I call James Dornan to be followed by Tavish Scott, please. Thank you, President Officer. I'd like to join with uh, my colleague Drew Smith and welcome Kenny Stewart to, the, to the, the Chamber. I've got a feeling that Kenny, like many of us, has got a hangover from the Commonwealth Games and is here for a wee cure. Uh, nice to see you, Kenny, and thanks for your help. Uh, I'm in an extremely lucky position of having Hamden Park in my doorstep, which meant that for the duration of the Games, outside my office in Mount Florida, was buzzing with people excited at the first-class sport that they were on their way to witness or coming back from witnessing in the arena. No one who was there or watching TV will forget the travails of Ailey Child and Hannah Miley, Ross Murdoch, Lindsay Sharp, Libby Clegg, uh, so many others. But for me, the, highlight, uh, the sporting highlight of the Games was the incredible 13-year-old Derry Davis, which I'm sure my colleague Tavish Scott will probably want to speak about uh, in more detail. Uh, her smile after she won her bronze was, without a doubt, one of the great moments of the Games for me. For the 11 days of the Games area I represent, like so many others, was transformed not only by the sporting endeavours around it, but by the countless local community groups who arranged numerous events to really get into the Commonwealth Games spirit. On the Monday prior to the start of the Games, I attended a lane party held by the Gateway Residents Association in Battlefield, which was attended by members of the Barbados Commonwealth team after they had adopted them as their Commonwealth Games team earlier on. 
It was a great day with a massive turnout from local community, keen to welcome the Games to their area. And I know that this was appreciated by the Barbados team, as was their presence by the locals. And I have to thank the, the Barbados team for some of the athletes coming straight from training that day to make sure that the, the Games were seen as being part of the community and not just part of the arenas. The local Clincart Hill Paris Church hosted a coffee shop over the course of the Games, which kept them extremely busy, and the visitors to the Games well fed with a delicious selection of home baking and offer. And the parents, teachers and pupils of Mount Florida Primary School did a magnificent job of decorating the triangle grassed area just outside of their school and across the road from Hamden. I, passed it, well, I was driving past it one day and I saw people putting uh, knitted blankets round trees. So I thought, I need to stop here and see if there's somebody vandalising these trees in some way. And it was the school pupils and parents and, and, and teachers that were, were doing this to welcome people to the area. The communities of Crawfoot and Castlemilk decorated the streets in the way to Cathkin Braes with banners and flags. And thousands turned out to watch the mountain biking at the purpose-built mountain biking centre. The local community are rallying around to try to ensure that one of the lasting legacies of these games is an increase in the facilities at the mountain bike track so that it can become an urban centre of mountain bike, biking excellence. Casimo also turned out and forced to see the baton really reach its community, but it was carried for part of the way by Teresa Sadler, one of those nominated to carry the baton by members of her community, and who is another ex excellent example of a local champion in the area who is involved in a number of local groups and campaigns in the community, over and above the fantastic work she does as chair of Castle and Housing Association. The baton really was just another example of the community spirit across the Commonwealth that these games fostered. The Queen's Baton travelling more than 198,000 kilometres across all parts of the Commonwealth and was warmly welcomed wherever it went. Another local people who carried the baton on its journey to Celtic Park was Carol Patterson, who runs a magnificent Saturday club in Aussies based at Cathcart Old Parish Church. It will come as no surprise to the people in this chamber who know the Reverend Neil Gilbraith that his church was jam-packed with events as part of his celebration city. Glasgow, the caring city, has worked on more than 55 of the 71 Commonwealth countries which had teams competing in the Games. I hosted one of these events, a night of Celtic rock with Eric Faulkner of Bay City Rollers fame and an up-and-coming Glasgow band, The Chaplains, named after the comedian and not the Reverend Neil, with lead singer Jill Jackson. It was a great evening with more than a few ladies of a certain age a bit excited to meet a Bay City Roller. It's amazing how quickly some can revert to their screaming teenager phase. This was just a num one of a number of events that took place, but undoubtedly the highlight, out with my night of course, was Brave Hearts the Musical, starring the kids from the aforementioned Saturday Club in Aussies. Now, for those who don't know it, the Saturday Club in Aussies are, are clubs for children with disabilities of, of varying kinds, and to see them put in the effort and, and put on such a performance was extremely touching as well as very, very entertaining. I also we have to give a message to all those dedicated ladies, and they were all ladies, that's why I say it, who worked so hard to make sure that the tea rooms were open for everybody that attended over the period of that 11 days. This is just a small flavour of the more than 120 events that were put on over the course of the Celebration City Festival. The whole area was a cacophony of sights and sounds, and it's clear that there is a want for there to be a lasting legacy of the Games. Presiding officer, we are here to talk of legacy, and for me it will come in many different guises. As a board member of Scottish Women in Sport, I was particularly delighted to see that Scottish women had their best games ever. We need to keep that momentum going and do all we can to ensure that a lasting legacy of these games is getting more women of all ages involved and engaged in sport. But I suspect that the greatest legacy for my great city will be the reawakening of community spirit which took place before and during the games. I, I see that the we talk about part of the legacy being about humanity, and I have not seen greater examples of humanity than I did see over the two weeks, uh, roughly the two weeks of the Commonwealth Games, with people from all over the world working together, enjoying each other's company, and making sure that the Games for everybody were, as somebody has already said, the friendly Games, and of course it would be, because Glasgow is without a doubt the friendly city. Thank you very much. Many thanks. I now call Tavish Scott to be followed by Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I start by uh, joining with James Doran and indeed colleagues from across the chamber in the collective love-in for all those who made Glasgow 2014 work. It was uh, without question a great uh, achievement uh, and in judging the legacy, I suspect, uh, not just in sporting terms but in economic terms, there will be a much good uh, that comes uh, of that. As a Shetlander, it's difficult not to start with not just Eric Davis but actually the three uh, girls who made Team Scotland. Uh, Erids was a fantastic success to win a bronze medal in a para uh, swimming 
discipline was uh, all the greater success for two reasons. Firstly, it was so unexpected. In all the assessments I saw, including asking um, the uh, top of uh, uh, Scottish swimming what they expected to happen, at no time was her success uh, expected. Uh, and that's why it's a triumph for her personally, but also for her coach and for her family uh, and for, indeed, for all of Shetland. And we're all very proud of her indeed. Uh, and, and, but also, we are equally proud, and we have to be equally proud, of Andrea Strachan, uh, who made the 50 metres final uh, breaststroke. She is one of the eight fastest girls in the 50 metres uh, in the Commonwealth. And that is one heck of an achievement uh, for her, uh, again, personally, but also for her coaches, also her coaches at Edinburgh University, where she's on the swim team uh, there, and for her mum and dad. And if there's something good I did in that whole... Oh, I did two things that were very good during, that, um, uh, the, during the 10 days of the Commonwealth Games. The first is I, did, I spent a lot of money in the bars of Glasgow, so I did my bit to help your economy, Mr Doran, um, although I'd rather that didn't go home to Shetland. But, um, uh, but the second thing I did was to take a, a text message while Andrea was swimming in the, uh, the semi-final from her dad saying, there's any chance you can get some tickets for the final because the family have run out. And I'd like to thank a number of people. I won't... Uh, mention them all today, but I'd like to thank a number of people who really helped to make that happen, uh, because I was very proud to see, her swim, to see Andrea swim in the final, but I was uh, even uh, better as a Shetlander knowing that her whole family were there, her, her grandfather was there, a bunch of uh, her wider family were there, uh, and to see someone you've known for a long time uh, swim in a final of the Commonwealth Games takes a bit of beating. Uh, so too for Linda Flaws, who uh, was in Team Scotland's table tennis team. Uh, she's doing exams at the moment, poor soul, to get back to university in a couple of weeks' time because she was in Tokyo uh, competing in, uh, in an international table tennis event some time back so as to make the grade and qualify for Team Scotland. Well, that worked, uh, and we hope her university markers look favourably upon, um, uh, upon the work she's now doing to make sure she continues her glittering, uh, uh, glittering academic career as well. I should say about Linda that she was skinning my son on a football field age 10 uh, so she's a very talented young girl at every sport uh, and will continue uh, to be so. Uh, there were so many great memories uh, of the Games, uh, but I thought uh, two of the most abiding aspects for me was the support for all the home nations. I, I must confess, I didn't know so many Scots knew the words to Jerusalem quite so well, uh, but it was quite noticeable that night when Hannah Miley won, when Ross Murdoch won, and when Andrea qualified for the final of the 50 breaststroke, that when the uh, English lad who won, the, and I'm going to forget the discipline now, but won an event that night, uh, the place erupted in the same kind of way. And that was the experience I had at all the events I went to, that the support for uh, English athletes, for Welsh athletes, and of course for Team Scotland. Yes, the roof did go off when Team Scotland won, uh, but the support for all the home nations was absolutely astronomical. And I think that's uh, made me very proud to be a Scot, and it made me very proud to be uh, part, of, uh, uh, part of these proceedings as well. Similarly, when the Malaysian uh, Rugby Sevens team did a lap of honour at Ibrox, haven't seen many laps of honour at Ibrox recently by anyone, but uh, uh, they, were, they, were the, uh, they were the first. Uh, they did a lap of honour kind of halfway through the, the end of the, of the Sunday morning uh, proceedings, uh, and they did it uh, just to say thanks to the fans who had cheered them through defeat after defeat after defeat. They probably did more for Malaysian diplomacy than anything else that's going on at the moment. But I was very proud to see, again, the whole stadium rising uh, to them, and selfies were taken, and fun was had by lots of kids rushing down the front to have their photographs taken with these hulking, vast rugby players. 170,000 people at Ibrox over two days, a world record crowd for rugby. If there's a legacy, it's probably that Rugby Sevens has come to Scotland. Or we should say really come home, because it started in Melrose after all, but it's come home. But that, I thought, was a tremendous achievement. And for me at Hamden, the other two were that uh, on the day that uh, I saw David Rudisha lose to uh, the absolutely astonishing um, Botswanan uh, athlete Nigel Amos in the 800 metres. I never thought I'd see someone like Rudisha lose a race after he'd won the Olympics. Uh, but it was the, the day before, the two days before, when I saw a Nigerian discus thrower in, again, the para, uh, in the para discipline, uh, to, uh, walk into the um, throwing ring, throw both of his crutches down, and with one, uh, with one leg throw the discus 45 metres and come second, where he won the silver medal that day. He did a lap of honour too, and believe me, hand and stood uh, for that. I, uh, just uh, unbelievable. And the, the decision, if I may say so, to integrate the games uh, of uh, able-bodied athletes with those who uh, have disabilities was a brilliant one, absolutely brilliant, because across sport, I thought that came across uh, fantastically. If there's one point of legacy, presiding officer, uh, for me, as well as all the ones that I think Liz Smith rightly mentioned in the context of schools and leadership uh, and um, walking to school and participation, all these things that, uh, we, uh, that other colleagues have rightly mentioned. For me, it is levelling out the playing field so that 
people, no matter where they are in Scotland, uh, can both compete at an elite level, but also just take part. And for my part of the world, it's just the ability for sports clubs to take part against other sports clubs in whatever their discipline is right across the country. And I know the Minister is very seized with this, and I thank her for her very positive response on this point. It's not just yesterday, uh, but also in, in, on other occasions as well. I really do recognise her commitment to that. Uh, but that would be a great legacy for me, that no matter where you live in Scotland, you can make sure an Erid Davis or an Andrew Strachan or a Linda Flaws or the Shetland rugby team can take part as well. And if we do that, then we're making real progress. Thank you very much. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's been a good debate. We've had a revelation from John Mason here this afternoon. He's too old to be responsible for left in charge of a foam finger. And we've had confirmation from Sandra White that Glasgow people are great at telling you where to go. I think both those things are absolutely true. But it has been a, an excellent debate that has not only paid tribute to the wonderful success of our Commonwealth uh, Games athletes, but also just as significantly to how these games can be consolidated, that success can be consolidated, sustained and built upon. I am proud that these have been Glasgow's games, but they've also very much been Scotland's games, as we've heard. Such has been the success that most communities feel they have some connection somewhere to a successful sportsman or woman. Indeed, I know just how excited my nieces were, both keen swimmers, when Ross Murdoch won his gold medal, given he is a very leaving lad and trained at the same swimming pool where Beth and Emily, my two young nieces, swim with that said same local club. Indeed, as originally as a veil boy, I felt a little bit of civic pride having started my swimming experience at the veil baths, although I did that at the age of six, but I didn't learn to swim until I was 16 at the Brock Baths in Dumbarton. I should put that on the record. There was a, a late blossomer presiding officer in relation to that, but I don't think we should underestimate the boost that such success will give young sports people right across Scotland, but also the civic pride that will be fostered right across Scotland's towns, cities and villages, not just by the medal-winning sportsmen and women, but all of those that participated. And I think Tavis Scott made that point very well. I don't think we can underestimate that. Can I pay tribute to the partnership work between the Scottish Government, local councils and Sports Scotland in developing around 150 community sports hubs? That is already a lasting legacy, bringing together various sports clubs, various community assets and various volunteers from those different clubs to work together to get a greater outcome for young people being involved in sport. And it's starting already to show some wonderful successes. Um, can also, in terms of building on this, commend, I hope, the Scottish Government's Community Empowerment Bill is a very real opportunity to ensure that community assets such as community centres and sports facilities that do not always appear to have a long-term strategy and use within communities can potentially become community-owned, community-developed and community-led sports initiatives. I think there are a number of examples in Glasgow where that could be a, a significant success. Uh, to promote the quality of those facilities that could be enhanced and actually there could be greater use of those facilities as well. And I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that that's something that the Scottish Government, that Sports Scotland, that Glasgow City Council, that Glasgow Life would be very much on board with. And it's very much in keeping with the, the Community Empowerment Bill aspirations right across society. And indeed, whilst I'm at it, it's only right to mention the fantastic job that Glasgow City Council, Glasgow Life and all the civic partners in the city that I represent did in having a wonderfully successful Games. I merely talk, comment on what potential opportunities to build on that further sit. I know the Scottish Government and Sports Scotland have invested greatly with the uh, sports national governing bodies to ensure we develop club sports in Scotland to boost grassroots participation, but also, just as importantly, to seek to ensure our most talented sportsmen and women excel. And how wonderful that programme was, greatly successful, 19 gold medals, 53 medals in total. But again, significantly, I think just as important is the largest team ever for Scotland. Having the opportunity to compete at that level is vital for the confidence of our sportsmen and women and for society in general. And I don't think Scotland's ever seen anything like it. In the time that I've got left, presiding officer, I'd maybe like to talk just a little bit about sporting pathways. Um, a similar point was made in relation to volunteers, I think, about sometimes with anything in society, those from 
uh, more middle-class backgrounds with a little bit more money find it easier to access, identify and progress in whatever pathway within life. And I don't think sport particularly is necessarily any different. Um, I did mention in my intervention to John Mason that it was the women's weightlifting that, that I went to at the Commonwealth Games where John was volunteering and directed me so ably to the, to the venue. But weightlifting is something I've been following more and more because of my association with the, the Gladiator Project in Easter House, uh, who are already seeing wonderful success with uh, young boys and girls going to Europe and winning gold medals for Scotland at the age of 12, 13, 14 years old and they're hoping they're hoping that in August 2015 they will be at the under 15 European Championships and in that instance they will represent Britain. There is a possibility there could be an athlete pathway award to enable them to, to go there. That's a potentiality, it's a possibility. And I also note that in the September of the same year in Samoa there's a, another event where they have the opportunity to to represent Scotland. So I, I, I raise that for a very specific reason. I'm wondering if the, the Minister could just have a look to see where the sporting pathways are for the young boys and girls from Easter House and beyond are uh, in terms of weightlifting and progressing to that next level because the volunteers there do a wonderful job. And they have had support, but it's just that extra push, that extra nudge to support them to go to the next level. I'm sure there are stories right across the country, uh, and I know money has to be spent in the wisest possible way, but that's a certain area that, that I'm passionate in. So, in concluding, uh, the Commonwealth Games were clearly a wonderful success, but they will only really have a true legacy if we work at it. The real hard work starts now. It's wonderful to cheer people over the finishing line and to win medals. The tough bit is developing it from here on in, but it's been a pleasure to take part in this afternoon's debates. Many thanks. I call Elaine Murray to be followed by Marco Biaggi. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Now, many, many years ago in the first session of Parliament, I had the good fortune to have the post of Deputy Minister for Tourism, Culture and Sport. Uh, and it's fairly obvious from the title, I had some pretty good gigs in that respect. Uh, Cannes Fest, F Film Festival, Edinburgh Film Festival, Scottish Opera and various other things. But I think probably the one that I enjoyed most of all uh, was being involved with the Scotland team in Manchester in 2002. Now, I'd known Manchester a bit because back in the 80s, I'd been involved with a research project with a scientist at the Christie Hospital. And I spent some time working there from time to time. And at that time, it was a city with a great cultural uh, uh, industrial and political traditions, but to a certain extent had fallen on hard times. So when, when I went back in 2002, I could actually barely recognise the city because it had changed so much. The whole change in the appearance, in the atmosphere and the confidence of the city was very, very marked. Now, two events were credited with that change. One is terrible, obviously the provision YRA bombing in 1996. The other part which associated with the regeneration was the Commonwealth Games. And so I think to many of us attending with the Scottish team at that time, the parallel with Glasgow was so striking and the seed was planted to bring the Games to uh, uh, Glasgow in 2014. And I was particularly pleased, I have to say, when I was watching the Games on the television to see Louise Martin presenting some of those prizes because Louise was such a mainstay of the Scottish team and such a mainstay of the Commonwealth Games. It's so crucial to bring it, bring it there, I think she has to take a great deal of the credit for the success of the Games this year. But congratulations also to everybody else, to all the politicians, everybody else who has worked hard uh, to, to bring this here, all, and all the people who made it such a tremendous success. Some of the legacy of the Games, of course, is already in place. It gives me some amusement to remember that when I was in Manchester, I was lobbied by one Chris Hoy uh, about the need for a competition standard velodrome in Scotland. Well, we now have that state-of-the-art velodrome in Scotland, and it's actually named after him. Uh, from what I knew of uh, Chris Hoy, I'm sure he was far too modest to imagine that it ever would be uh, named after him. And it was, of course, a tremendously wonderful experience. This time last week, I was on the bus from Eurocentral to Hamden uh, to see Ailey Childs powering to her, uh, uh, her silver medal, to see David Warren, an extraordinary sport uh, with the T54, uh, 1,500 metres, being cheered on by Scots as much as by English people uh, to his success, to see indeed Amos uh, beat Radisha. And I was also there on Saturday. Uh, I don't know whether I actually did see Usain Bolt, because he was going so fast, he was just like a sort of a blur, but I did see him afterwards, <laughs> whether I actually caught him racing is another thing. Uh, and absolutely, it was an absolutely marvellous experience. 
However, the overall success of the Games in years to come will be judged on what changes for the better they affected in both Glasgow and in the rest of Scotland. Because over the years, as we've seen with Manchester, uh, you know, the memories of the Games eventually fade, even though they are great memories for, for all of us who were involved. And Games will be held in other nations and there will be other nations games talked about. Now, I have absolutely no idea, no uh, doubt at all that the Games will inspire more young people to take up sport and to become involved in sports that they would otherwise not have considered. Talented young athletes will be able to train now in top-class facilities in Scotland, though some of that training will still go on in parts of the United Kingdom too. And in some parts of it, the Scotland members of the public will also have access to these tremendous venues. A new generation of elite athletes will have gained inspiration from what they have seen during the last couple of weeks in Glasgow. But I wanted to return, I think, to what I touched on in, in the question earlier this week is, what about most of us who do not possess any great talent for sport? Will we actually become more active and will we sustain that activity over future years? And I actually don't think we should expect elite sport to deliver that because apart from anything else, the physiques and the performance of elite athletes is so different to most of us that the way we love watching them, we don't actually identify because they know, we know that we will never be like that. Getting more people more active more often has been an aspiration since the review of Sport 21 in 2003 that I took part of, and I'm sure it was uh, probably before that. Uh, an aspiration actually which has been very difficult to achieve over the years, and I wonder whether part of that is because it is presumed to be a side effect of success in elite sport. Unfortunately, getting more people, ordinary people, more active more often is not something that can be delivered top down. So even if you delivered first class facilities right across the country, you cannot ensure that people who currently don't pay part in physical activity will actually take it up. And actually, I think the ordinary people, the vast majority of us will be encouraged to be more physically active if they see people like us. If we see people like us taking part in physical activities, which we, we enjoy. And that's where friends and colleagues and family members can help each other to improve their physical fitness. Most people who have some degree of physical capability will be able to find some form of exercise which they can enjoy with swimming, cycling, jogging, walking, and they can set themselves personal goals to get, go a bit faster, a bit further, carry on a bit longer. It's not always easy to maintain physical activity once started. People who have a busy lifestyle need something which fins, fits in. And one of the attractions for me of walking is actually you can fit it in with this job. Although I wouldn't power walk up to anybody's door and demand to know how they voted, I have to say. And of course, in Scotland, outdoor activity is great at this time of the year, but less so when the sun doesn't rise until almost nine and sets again before four. So there needs to be a long-term motivation uh, once the novelty wears off. And I think there are three aspects. There needs to be more publicity around individuals improving their fitness through normal physical activity. We hear a lot about people on diets. We see lots of programs of people losing weight, but we don't hear a lot about people becoming more physically active. And I think there needs to be more concentration on that. I think the second part is the encouragement and support from others in taking part, the community aspect. Uh, and finally, the personal motivation to improve. Because, you know, a personal best is not only achieved by an elite athlete. Any one of us, whatever our age, whatever our build, who has some degree of physical capability, can choose an activity and be the best that we can be. Many thanks. And I now call on Marco Biaggi to be followed by Colin Keir. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When it comes to uh, major sporting events, legacy is one of those things we debate very hotly, not least the equality strand of the trifecta that was mentioned, but if there is one thing I can say with absolute surety about the 2014 Commonwealth Games, it is that they have changed the definition of the Glasgow kiss forever. <laughs> I have marched in the name of pride many times. I know the feeling very well. And I felt pride with every further act that demonstrated not just the success of the Games, to which we all owe so many people thanks, but also our values of respect and diversity. During the Games, the rainbow flag flew from the Scottish Government's headquarters. The One Scotland campaign was launched with billboards everywhere. And at the Games, a Pride House flourished. Not a last-minute, hastily permitted Pride House as at London 2012, but a centre that was a real focal point for LGBTI participants, guests and discussion, and hosted over 6,000 visitors. The Hub received financial support from the Scottish Government, but what matters so much more is the political support received and the legacy that will leave. At the opening night for Pride House, Shona Robinson, the Cabinet Secretary, was there on behalf of the Scottish Government. So too was David Gravenberg, the Games Chief Executive. This wasn't an unauthorised sideshow sitting on the fringes. This was an integral part of the Games. 
And over the days of the Games, the First Minister, the Deputy Prime Minister and Ed Miliband all visited too. There were selfies for everyone, fortunately no bacon rolls. On July the 29th, Peter Tatchell, a man more noted for attempting citizens' arrests of Robert Mugabe than being gushing, was fulsome in his praise for the Scottish Government. An activist used to mealy-mouthed statements and disappointment came to Scotland and found the real deal of commitment to equality. But at that opening night, we heard voices from beyond Scotland and the West, important ones, like Dr Frank Mugisha from Uganda, Monica Tavengwa from Botswana and Palav Patankar from India. They were part of a series of links made by campaigners in Scotland to forge lasting links between campaigners here and campaigners in countries where legal equality on LGBTI rights seem a far off dream. Because Scotland's campaigners recognise the importance of having their work led by those on the ground in those countries and using the Commonwealth Games and the shared experience and history as an opportunity to empower others. Equality Network each day in the run up to the Games highlighted in turn a Commonwealth country and their equivalent organisation there. And it matters. It matters because 80% of Commonwealth nations have some form of legal persecution against people who are homosexual, bisexual, transsexual, and so on. Millions risk their liberty or their lives if they just turn to their loved one and express their feelings. That happens today in the Commonwealth. And it's a sad fact that those anti-gay laws are in the main also a legacy, a legacy of the colonialism and imperialism, that very troubled history of domination and conversion, and one that, one that has left many nations scarred but also sensitive to what could have been seen as attempts to repeat that history by further lectures or domination, understandably so. Uganda's LGBTI laws have been rallying points for activists around the world, but while the most severe, there are no means alone. You know, calls to exclude Uganda from the Games came from an understandable sense of hurt. But there are many nations in the Commonwealth whose records on human rights raise very serious questions. Singapore is an authoritarian dictatorship. But the best way, I believe, to do what we did was what we did, to continue to take the approach by inspiration rather than domination. You know, Scotland has achieved a level of diversity that is far different to what it was for the first 11 of these games. For the first 11 of these games, being gay here in Scotland was still a crime. We want to demonstrate the kind of Scotland that we are, we want to be, and are increasingly becoming. Because although the law now respects all attitudes, don't always do likewise, and sporting grounds are one of those fields in which the reports from homo of homophobia are still the strongest and most frequent. And if we are to get all of Scotland physically active and participating, that is one group who must be understood and those barriers overcome. And I hope that one of the legacies will be the links built up between organisations here in Scotland. And in particular, I would hope the Scottish Government could do what it can to encourage the continuation of Pride House as an ongoing centre for promotion of LGBTI rights, both in sport here, but also more widely. These games will be remembered. They'll be remembered as the people's games, as the friendly games, as a successful games, as a progressive games too. And I'm sorry that uh, Paul Wheelhouse is gone because as a, Bel voice, uh, as a Belfast boy, I was going to rib him for Team Northern Ireland coming one place below the hypothetical Team Gay in the medals league table. But there, are, uh, an, there is an important record that was set by Team Gay. And that is that this was the first ever time that two openly gay athletes took both gold and silver and stood on the same podium, Matthew Mitchum, Tom Daly. And it's a moment made for me all the sweeter to remember that it happened at the beautiful, refurbished Commonwealth Pool in my constituency and in the great city of Edinburgh. Thank you very much. I now call on Colin Keir to be followed by George Adam. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. As Liz Smith has actually pointed out uh, earlier, the legacy from the most successful Commonwealth Games ever is not easily defined. Every single person will have a view of what that legacy is, and I suspect nobody will be wrong. These Commonwealth Games were a showcase for Glasgow and Scotland, and they certainly didn't let us down. 
There were the Clydesiders, there was the personal hardship stories from the likes of Lindsay Sharp and Libby Clegg. There was the handling of the pressure of being the poster girl for the games from Ailey Child. And who will ever lightly forget the wonderful smile and look of sheer happiness shown by 13-year-old swimmer Eric Davis. These were some of the great stories which made these games, and what they were was simply magnificent, and I would add my congratulations to everyone involved. But of course, there was much more to these games than just competition. And the question now, of course, is what do we do now that they're finished? As we know, the Scottish Government produced the document A Games Legacy for Scotland. The legacy themes consulted on, which were of an active, connected, sustainable and flourishing Scotland, cover every aspect of life. Glasgow produced a game so enlightened that the world couldn't help but see that in the 21st century, our nation stands tall. And of course, and as a course of the actions taken by those participating in the whole event, this country didn't need its politicians to stand up and inform the Commonwealth what we, uh, what we are as a nation feel about the issues of community, equality and diversity. Regardless of your skin colour, if you're male, female, disabled, LGBT, or have a different religious belief from your neighbour, whatever, you are a valued part of our community and you have a part to play in our community. This alone would be a tremendous legacy for our latest Commonwealth Games, but we can do more. We have issues, of course, with health, particularly within our cities, which could be helped if we could encourage people to rediscover exercise. And I'm sure the irony isn't lost in the chamber that someone who is as overweight as I am, lecturing on the dangers of obesity and diabetes, perhaps looks a tad hypocritical. But my point is that if someone like me, who is privileged to receive an international honours in my younger days, can let themselves go physically, then how much easier it is to follow the wrong direction if you've grown up with a bad diet and difficult circumstances. I do commend such initiatives, such as the Physical Activity Implementation Plan in this respect, but the big issue will always be how to change people's attitudes to exercise and health. And once we start to change attitudes, can we get away from the perception from some that you need a pair of £100 trainers to take part? Or the difficulties of taking part in sport without having to pay substantial amounts of money to use facilities. Sport and general exercise should not be out of bounds to anyone in our society. Moving to a legacy dealing with elite sport, we should be delighted that Scotland, the, the Scotland team achieved, achieved so much success. For many of the athletes, a medal or a personal best performance will be seen as a stepping stone to further uh, success. The Scottish Institute of Sport is obviously starting to reap rewards, and I heartily commend the Director of High Performance, Mike Whittingham, and his team for the job that they're doing. I hope there is a constant review of what happens at the Institute. Even the much lauded and successful Australian Institute of Sport came under fire as the rest of the world caught up uh, with Australia and elite performance levels were perceived to have dropped. I'd also like to mention the issue of identifying young talent in order to help them through into elite competition. While youngsters may find a sport and enjoy it at around the age of about nine or ten years, it's also important to offer other options. Not only might they find something new that they like, but I would like to think that there is uh, a talent spotting method to encourage youngsters who may be physically more suited to another sport, perhaps in, in their teens, to move to a discipline that they may achieve elite success. This was done, I believe, uh, by UK rowing a few years ago on a, on a larger scale and is common practice in countries such as Australia. And finally, presiding officer, uh, there is one other thing. Team Scotland achieved remarkable results at the Commonwealth Games, but that is the top level our country can compete. In most sports, and athletics being the perfect example here, our athletes must challenge for places in a GB team to compete at the highest level, that is, the World and European Championships and Olympics. This usually means fewer athletes are able to come through and gain the experience to compete efficiently at the top level. Is it a coincidence, for instance, that we've had less international success in long distance running since Scotland stopped sending a team to the World Cross Country Championships some 30 odd years ago? 
I believe the biggest legacy at elite level will be to see our Scottish teams competing at the highest level. But I'm afraid to say to bring a little bit of politics into it, the only chance that that can ever happen is with a yes vote on the 18th of September. Thank you. Many thanks. I call on George Adam to be followed by Alison Johnston. Thank you, President Officer. And first of all, I'd like to thank Glasgow. Thank Glasgow for the games, the friendly games, the biggest party ever. But seven miles down the road in Paisley, I get no invite. There was no invite for George. There was no tickets for George to go to any of these events. You know, all I had was the anti-social behaviour from the fireworks that went off in Parkhead, and I had to put the sound down to say to Stacey, did you hear these fireworks, Stacey? Can you hear them? We had the anti-social behaviour, but unfortunately, I would like to say that, uh, seriously, the presiding officer at Glasgow Airport was obviously the gateway to the Games. And being in Paisley, there was obviously a, a generation there. There was obviously all, most of the athletes came through our area, and there was quite an effect on the Paisley economy. So much so that when the batting relay, the Queen's batting relay, came to Paisley, my friend and colleague Brian Maguire was one of the community activists that. that ran through Paisley High Street with it and he does paisley.org and a website, a community-based website and he was getting it for that reason because of everything he'd done for the community and I think that was one of the great things about the Baton Relay itself because we had a fantastic day uh, in Paisley as well and also can I recommend uh, Brian as a great photographer because he makes me look good in some of the pictures that he's done for me as well but I would say with Patricia Ferguson that uh, she's saying that some of the sports we would have to look at that we weren't so successful at Craig uh, Mahoney, who's, the profe uh, who's Professor Mahoney, is a professor in sports psychology and is UWS uh, principal. He actually has a debate that he says, you know, do what the Australians do. Specialise in what you're good at. Find the sports that what you're good at and excel at the sports. Now, I like football, but I did say on Twitter during the games, I'm, I'm giving up this football malarkey and it's a bowling for me from now on if we can win that many medals. And I have to say to John Mason, you know, who could doubt the Scots? If we win anything, we're going to fill any arena to make sure we're there to celebrate it, you know. And I think that's one of the things we have to remember from the Games as well. But one of the, the Commonwealth Games... Uh, you know, Glasgow brought, uh, brought the world to, to Scotland, the Commonwealth Games, in the opening ceremony, and I have to say that uh, Marco Biaggi's already stole my John Barham and Glasgow kiss lines, so thanks for that. But uh, from that, at the beginning of the ceremony, they set out their stall and said exactly what Glasgow is all about. You know, Glasgow was just being Glasgow, the Glasgow we all know, the town that we all know, even though it's our neighbour next door and we have a bit of banter between each other, we all know Glasgow is a friendly city, not as good as Paisley, but it's very friendly, you know. Uh, but uh, even to the closing ceremony when you had Deacon Blue, Kylie and Lulu, never thought I'd see all three of them in the one line. But, you know, it took me back to my teenage years in the 80s where these were all the... It was like going to a big uh, gig when I was younger. But the world watched, and he watched a small northern European nation compete at a level that five million people probably shouldn't have been competing at. And it shows that the commitment of the Scottish Government and Glasgow City Council working together, that what we can actually achieve in Scotland if we put our minds to it. There's been so many good points. You know, if you're trying to think of the great things that happened, I think Eddie Davis is obviously number one because her smile just uh, lit up the whole games when she got her bronze medal. But Libby Clegg with the T12 uh, 100 metres, you know, she was the first one to win a gold medal in Hamden. And many people would say that Hamden as an athletic stadium, the roar is better and it's a better stadium as an athletic stadium as it is as a football stadium. I wouldn't know. I wasn't there. I not haven't had any tickets, but I know that debate has actually been mentioned. One of the things that... Uh, one of the things that will remember me is actually, I will remember is the fact that Sweet Caroline being sang by... Oh, sorry, yes, no problem. Trisha Ferguson. I'm really feeling very sorry for Mr Adam here, given that he didn't have any tickets for the Games, but I wonder, did he apply? <laughs> he did Mr. indeed. Adam. He did indeed numerous times. But uh, one of the things that uh, I remember is Sweet Caroline being so sung by 40,000 fans at the Rugby Sevens and Ibrox of all places. Who would have thought we'd have actually seen that in our lifetime as well? And uh, one of the things that I, uh, my wife, Stacey, managed to get some tickets uh, when she went along. I was working at the time, so she went along with some friends and she went to see the judo uh, on three occasions. And now she's an expert in the judo. I had to sit there and watch it and actually explained how the actual whole thing worked as well. And that was interesting to hear that non-stop, how Stacey's now an expert after three days of going to see the judo. But I finally did get tickets. Yes. Uh, is the member now doing more housework than previously? <laughs> George Adam. 
I'll plead the fifth in that one, if you don't mind, at this stage. But uh, one of the things that I will say, I did finally get tickets to go and see the boxing on the Saturday, and I enjoyed that. It was, uh, it was a great event in the Hydro, and I think that's a legacy when you look at what has been left to Glasgow. It's all the fantastic uh, facilities that are there within uh, the, the whole area as well. You know, but one of the things that reminds me is uh, the true legacy is the parasports, the first time that the parasports were work, uh, together with our major games. And I think that made the difference, because that was some of the great stories that came out of it. You know, Team Scotland... It was just inspirational what they did as well. You know, one of the things I would actually add is that Glasgow made sure that their state-of-the-art facilities were enjoyed by tourists, uh, the athletes. But one of the things that I even went to George Square myself to see to sample it when Stacey was at the hospital for MRI scan, and a hundred pound later, in a nice Scott Team Scotland hoodie. Uh, I'm the oldest 45-year-old hoodie you've ever seen in your life, but uh, it was great. It was absolutely fantastic when we were there. But one of the things I would say is, and it shows us what we can do. And the important thing, I know the Cabinet Secretary is aware that we are working with Pel Paisley Kelburn Hockey Club and St Murn Football Club to try and get a sports hub in Paisley. And I would say in closing, let's see the legacy is building on, building on projects like this, ensuring that we can actually get access from children like the children in Fergusy Park in Paisley to make a difference so that they can actually aspire to be as good as some of the athletes in Team Scotland. Many thanks. I now call on Alison Johnson to be followed by Richard Lyle. Um, thank you. I'd like to begin my contribution to this debate by saying thank you, Glasgow, and thanks to all who were involved. The Games were a success because of those who bid, those who organised, those who volunteered, the host city volunteers, the Clydesiders, the coaches, and the hundreds of thousands who came to support the athletes. The Games were a success because of these athletes who came from across the globe to compete here in Scotland. And they were a success because of our fascination with those who dedicate time, blood, sweat, tears and often cash to being the best they can be in their chosen sport. And I know that we'll all have our own personal memories and stories from the Games. As someone involved in sport from my earliest years, I've attended a few events and these really were very special. Um, George Adam may be slightly disturbed to learn that I was one of the very lucky ones in the ballot and was fortunate to attend several events. And if I'd been organised, I might have stayed in the city, but I'd had to have booked accommodation before, before it was all booked up. However, if I'd done that, I would have missed some of the memorable travel moments that, that Sandra White touched on. Um, Steve Montgomery, the managing director of ScotRail, could regularly be found mingling with the Gras Glasgow Central Rail queue, and it was quite a queue at times. But a really well-managed one and, and good-tempered one. And he was offering advice on the most sensible way to get back to Edinburgh on a given evening. And I didn't only see him there once or twice. But taking his advice, I chose Central rather than Queen Street as a departure point. And that meant that I enjoyed the deadpan delivery of the cross-country train guard who solemnly announced as a prelude to other catering news, there is no rooftop garden on this train. <laughs> <laughs> or the Mount Florida station announcer who updated the hundreds returning from Hampden Park on the, latel, the latest medal tally uh, and his views of his take on national characteristics. I don't think I can actually share them in the chamber, but he could certainly give a few of the fringe stars a lesson in timing and delivery. Uh, Glasgow embraced the Games and as the days passed, the feeling of pride and enjoyment in what the city and its people added to the spectacle simply grew. I was privileged enough to attend hockey, netball, track cycling and athletics. And the warmth, humour and desire to help visitors and spectators get to where they needed to be, it was palpable. Those delivering the games had clearly learned much from the London blueprint. Those games were a huge success, as were Glasgow's. Glasgow 2014 brought people together from across the globe in a way that only sport can Spectators did cheer on their own country folk, but the applause from the crowd for each and every athlete and endeavour is testament to the generous and knowledgeable audience that Glasgow attracted. And the crowd defied definition, from babes in arms to our oldest citizens, folks of all shapes, sizes, nationalities and walks of life, cheered every individual, regardless of outcome or level of celebrity. I was really chuffed with Ailey Child's silver by Mark Dry's bronze by Lindsay Sharp's determination to achieve. Guy Lermont's personal best in the 800 metre final was a real highlight. Ailish McColgan's gutsy run, Beth Potter's 10,000 metre PB. Emily Dudgeon, who narrowly missed out the 800 metre final after a fantastic performance. There are far too many great performances to mention. 
But medals and records aside, it's the endeavour of all those. Those who may have to wait till next time, those who will have to go back to the drawing board. But that's what makes the Games what it is, what makes it so special. And I've no doubt that many people, young and old, will be inspired to follow in the footsteps of those they've cheered on. And there have been sports for all ages and inclinations on show. Jo Pavey's 5K bronze in her fifth decade and months after giving birth will spur on many a middle-aged runner. And seeing bowls being played by rising young stars will have an impact too. But there are questions posed by the Games. How can our part-time netball and hockey players compete with full-time professional athletes? Which sports should receive more funding? We need to look even more closely at formal links between our top coaches and our earliest educators in school. Physical education and games aren't the same thing, and we need to invest in physical literacy for our young people, as this will pay dividends in terms of long-term health and well-being, self-confidence and enjoyment of sport. The challenge now is to deliver a truly meaningful legacy. Part of this legacy is visible. It's the velodrome, the rest of the Emirates Arena, the housing with its district heating scheme. And it's not just about facilities in Glasgow. This is a nationwide issue. Let's make sure that these facilities are properly maintained, that we proudly take care of them, that we learn lessons from what happened at Meadowbank in Edinburgh. And Bob Doris too is right to highlight community sports delivery as an important model. The other part of the challenge is to make sure that those who'd like to use the facilities have access to them, that they're affordable, that we have enough coaches in place, and that no one's priced out of a more active lifestyle. And let's look at good practice like Scottish Athletics Club Together programme, which is about partnership and building a meaningful legacy from the grassroots up. The Games don't take place in a vacuum. The world watched and Scotland's message of equality was clear and heartfelt. The inclusion of parasport made the Games even better. Pride House played an important role and I was proud to be a patron. The impact off the house in a central location can't be understated and I'd like to thank and congratulate the board, the volunteers and all those who supported this public sign of our support for the LGB community. There's a recognition amongst many prominent campaigners and academics that the Games have helped to elevate the issue of public support for gay equality. Are you drawing to a close, please? Indeed, presiding officer. I think the, the great use of the platform the Games gave us was used. It was used by UNICEF, the fundraising campaign was innovative, appropriate and welcome. Jubilee Scotland got involved, highlighting unfair national debts. You know, um, those in the Seychelles have an astounding £13,000 of debt for each of its citizens. So there are barriers that prevent I would be grateful all of those in the Commonwealth taking part. And I'm sure we will continue to challenge these as we seek to deliver a meaningful legacy. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Richard Lyle to be followed by Hans Anna Malik. Thank you, um, President Officer. Can I firstly say to George Adam, if I had known he was looking for free tickets, I would have given my two boxing tickets, which unfortunately I had to forego due to other circumstances. Um, I would also like to add my congratulations to everyone who played a part in delivering such a successful Commonwealth Games. Yes, I will. George Adam. I wasn't wanting free tickets, I was willing to pay for them. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd that. get you back. Richard Lyle. Uh, I think we proved to the world without a shadow of a doubt that Scotland is more than capable of hosting major events such as this on time and on budget. And again, this will be demonstrated when Scotland hosts the Golf and World for the 2014 Ryder Cup. 2014 Commonwealth Games were a resounding success. However, these games were about more than just 11 days of sport. And I'm sure there will be a long term and lasting legacy from the Games. As seen from other major sporting events, this does not come about automatically. Manchester hosting the Commonwealth Games in 2002 can be held up as a good example of having a successful legacy as it accelerated re regeneration in the city. I can personally testify to that, as then I worked for the Royal Bank and our office was based in Manchester, which I visited regularly. Manchester changed dramatically, as Elaine Murray already has said. And so the Games legacy for Glasgow 2014 has been a major focus throughout the planning stages of these Games. In order for Scotland to benefit from these Games, the legacy has focused on boosting sports participation, increasing physical activity, maximising economic benefit, promoting business growth and increasing employability and skills. Urban regeneration 
sustainable, sustainable development and promoting Glasgow and Scotland's image internationally. For these games, roughly 70% of the venues were already in place, but these have now been joined by other world-class sporting facilities, such as the Emirates Arena, including the Sir Chris Hoy Velodrome. And I remember visiting the building along with the members of the Health Committee and also the Athletes' Village, which are homes for the 21st century. Along with the new venues, some existing venues already have been upgraded, including Strathclyde Park in my own region, which hosted the triathlon events. $1.2 million has been spent in the park to upgrade the facilities for this event. And local residents are delighted because now the games are finished, that these upgrades are benefiting the whole community. I would like to take this opportunity to thank North Lancashire Council for working closely with the Games organisers and the Scottish Government to ensure that these enhancements to the park were carried out for the benefit of all. With Strathclyde Park being a satellite venue, transport to and from the venue was critical. And in, in this regard, I feel the Games have seen a lasting improvement in our rail network that has shown itself capable of coping with the large crowds seen at the Games. In preparation for the Games, over £2 million was spent at key stations, which were upgraded to enhance the experience of visitors to the Games. It is clear that the railway transport in Scotland is a significant asset to Scotland and that can contribute to economic legacy of the Commonwealth Games. As these games, Scotland, at these Games, Scotland had its most successful Games ever, as already has been said, 53 medals. However, the true success of these Games will be the legacy that is felt from the Games. In order to carry out a viable and long-term legacy, over 50 legacy 2014 national programmes are in place across Scotland. These programmes are generating jobs and training opportunities, investing in new or upgraded community facilities, which in turn are helping people get more active. Holding a major sporting event brings with it responsibilities in promoting human rights. In this case, I was also pleased to note that the Scottish Government is working to strengthen and empower communities across the Commonwealth, including South Africa, Uganda and Malawi. Malawi, which has a special place in our heart, where the Scottish Government funding is providing improved in infrastructure and sanitation for over 100,000 people. As Bob Doris already has said, I believe that independence for Scotland would mean that more Scottish Scot uh, sportswomen and, and men will have the opportunity to compete at the highest levels against the best competition in the world, with a view for an independent Scotland to have a Scottish Olympic and para Paralympic team in Rio in 2016. To finish, President Officer, the Commonwealth Games' values of humanity, equality and destiny are cherished in Scotland and have been right at the heart of our Games, and I'm sure to continue in our legacy vision for the future. I personally want to pay tribute to the Cabinet Secretary for all her hard work, for all the hard work done by Sports Scotland, by all the people who are associated with the Games, especially the hard work done by the people of Glasgow, the workers in Glasgow, North Lanarkshire and South Lanarkshire, and not forgetting Edinburgh City Council, and all the officials who work tirelessly to make these Games such a resounding success. I'm sure that Scotland will benefit and has shown the world that we can be independent, we can run a Games which is uh, tremendous and, as was already said by my friend uh, Colin Keir, if we vote yes on September the 18th, I think we will show the world that Scotland is a country to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Hans Alan Malik to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to talk about the legacy of the 20th Commonwealth Games uh, Glasgow today. And firstly, I think everyone here will agree that the Games have been a tremendous success. And I also want to wish to thank the Minister for her announcement in regards to facilities for para sports and also the additional money. She'll be a bit disappointed that I'm not criticizing her today, but this is a special day, I think. As someone who has had the privilege of watching and playing a part in the long journey from the bid, organizing bid to the closing ceremony, I have a few observations to make. One of the things that struck me the most was the spirit of working together by all, something that made me very, very proud. 
It showed me, once again, as always, the hospitality and the friendship the people of Glasgow offered people from around the world, and in fact, right across Scotland. From the start of the bidding for the Games, Glasgow City Council was given a substantial amount of support from a broad network of embassies, UK Foreign Office, and the British Councils, as well as friends all over the world, which has made it not only unique, but quite inclusive in the terms that it was very clear that coming together, working as a team, we could make this a success, which we've demonstrated. In today's day and age, every time when there, are, there is a sporting activity, an international sporting activity, many of the hosts are challenged by resources and by cooperation from others. We had been extremely lucky in all of those issues. And uh, I think that I want to mention the fact that uh, we haven't had an opportunity to thank some of the agencies who worked internationally for us to mention their hard work as well. Another important point is the role of Glasgow City Council. The councillors, officials, business people, not only in Glasgow but across Scotland and other parts of the UK, as well as the then First Minister Jack McConnell, whose vision and leadership ensured that all the relevant funds were in place, regardless of which government would be in place when the Games happened. That I have to welcome and thank him for personally, because I know that a lot of work went in with people like Patricia Ferguson himself, Archie Graham, leaders of the council and the council itself. I think that sometimes we underestimate the value of the contribution people make behind closed doors, and uh, I wanted to pay tribute to them. Whilst I watched the gymnastics, I was impressed by the excellent performance of the athletes. I was struck by the friendship and support between the gymnasts of the home countries. After all, many of the young men had trained together as part of Team GB. I don't want to underestimate and undervalue the support that Team GB gave to our athletes, something that I've, I welcome and I hope and wish we will continue to uh, use and demonstrate. Amazing efforts made by the people of Glasgow in general and by the volunteers, in particular welcoming visitors and volunteers from around the UK. And I in particular wish to thank the parents of the athletes. Parents make a huge personal effort, a contribution that we can't pay for, a contribution we can't realize and comprehend where parents are getting up day in, day out, week, seven days a week, giving their children, their young, every opportunity to be successful. The expenditure they incur in travel, in clothing, in paying fees, in paying uh, costs of clubs, tremendous. Hats off to them, all the parents. I think that uh, we also, I also want to take the opportunity to, to thank schools and colleges who have played their, their roles in, in supporting that success as well. A very positive mood that even the rain couldn't wash away, and that's fantastic. I think that we were very lucky. God had given us some good weather during the games as well, so everybody appreciates it. It doesn't only rain in Scotland. We do get the sun as well. But in order to secure a lasting legacy for the games, we need to enhance this positive strength and not waste it away and things to come. Legacy and skills should allow Glasgow to build on other national and international events, such as the European Europe football tournaments for one. I think that we need to be proud of what our athletes have achieved. 20% of the medals won in the Commonwealth Games were by the home countries. Fantastic achievement. Australia only managed 10%. So we have a challenge. When we go to Australia, we want to make sure that if we can't enhance and increase our medal tally, that we at least match it. Whilst I'm happy to wish Australia every success and hope they'll maybe invite me to some of the games, but I need to say that my, my wishes are only for the successful games and not in the medals because I want our own teams to do so. Presiding officer, I thank you for the opportunity to make a contribution today. I want to thank the minister for her announcement 
and also to Patricia, particularly amongst us who had a, a, a huge role to play historically in the Games. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I now call on Kenneth Gibson, after which we move to closing speeches. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. It is clear that every member in this chamber is of the opinion that the 2014 Commonwealth Games in Glasgow was nothing short of a massive success of which both Glasgow and Scotland can be rightly proud. The Games truly brought out the best in our largest city, the best in our friendly and welcoming citizens, and the best in our incredible athletes. Scotland took to the world stage, and from start to finish, it did not disappoint those who were watching. Many competitors will have been inspired to victory by a supportive crowd that cheered all but roared on Scotland's own. And finishing fourth in the medal table amongst nations with much larger populations than their own is a hugely impressive achievement by Team Scotland. Of course, the organisers of the event, Glasgow 2014, Glasgow City Council and the Scottish Government, plus all others who were involved uh, in the Games from the voluntary sector, the private sector, volunteers, uh, all have to take tremendous credit for helping to coordinate the biggest sporting and culture events Scotland has hosted, both seamlessly uh, and without issue. And it was great, for example, uh, at the closing ceremony to see the dancing lollipop ladies and a parade of Glasgow uh, City Council's uh, workforce um, round the track. Indeed, when Alan Cochrane of The Telegraph headlines his article, I'll admit it, the SNP deserve a medal for pulling this off, you know that something has gone exceptionally well. And Cabinet Secretary Shona Robeson deserves special praise for our 24-7 leadership, hard work and commitment. The Commonwealth Games is unique in many ways and anyone who watched the opening closing and ceremonies will attest the spirit uh, which is one of family and friendly sporting rivalry. And the Games also provided an opportunity for the host nation to evoke its culture and promote its values, sometimes very tongue-in-cheek. And I was proud that Scotland chose to show and demonstrate that we are a nation which is tolerant and inclusive to all, regardless of faith, race, gender or sexuality. And in the year in which Scotland passed the same-sex marriage bill, and in the knowledge that many competing nations still criminalise homosexuality, I believe it was important Scotland sent a message that we are a tolerant and inclusive society. And my colleague Marco Biaggi uh, expanded on this uh, tremendously through his excellent speech that focused on this particular aspect. I believe that uh, what we will see, that, that, that uh, we've seen in the Commonwealth Games, a very welcome expansion of para sports events, and with the medals that they were won, this reflects the ethos of the Games and its legacy: sporting inclusion and equality in and through sport. And it's vital we use the success of the Games to build on this achievement, ensuring people of all abilities and backgrounds uh, can access sport, thereby enhancing the chance of even greater success for Team Scotland at future events. Of course, funding. And planning is essential to ensure that people across the country of varying abilities and in different disciplines can benefit from access to the appropriate facilities. And I'm pleased that the Legacy 2014 Active Places Fund will help make this a reality in the months and years ahead. Sports Scotland National Inverclyde, uh, uh, sorry, Sports Scotland National Centre Inverclyde and Largs, in my own constituency, needs funding to demolish its 1950s accommodation block and build 60 new state-of-the-art fully disabled access twin rooms. Well, Sports Scotland National Centre in Verclyde is internationally renowned. Uh, Jose Mourinho gained his coaching badge there, for example, and home to Enville facilities for golf, football, hockey, squash, tennis and gymnastics, uh, with recent enhancements through generous donations, not least from uh, uh, the, the large lottery winners Colin and Chrissy Weir. The accommodation block is no longer fit for purpose, with only a small percentage of rooms suitable for those with accessibility issues. I'm therefore delighted that Cabinet Secretary announced today that the Scottish Government will provide £6 million on top of funding from Sports Scotland to transform the accommodation at large and help ensure that this facility uh, is unique in the United Kingdom. Scottish Disability Sports Annual Summer Camp will be held at the National Centre in Verclyde this year. And although they will not benefit uh, from the new facility this summer, I believe Inverclyde will become the para sports centre, not just for Scotland in the years to come, but the rest of the UK also. And this will be a truly great Commonwealth Games legacy for the National Sports Centre, for the people of Lards, surrounding communities and indeed Scotland and beyond. Of course, away from the sporting fields, the Games legacy is already being realised. Many of the volunteers have discovered new talents and gained experience, and I don't want to comment further on John Mason's uh, experiences or indeed Patricia Ferguson's, but it's of huge significance to those who have previously not been in employment and are now of confidence and skills they need to find work.
The UNICEF partnership launched by Ewan McGregor on opening night raised a fantastic £5 million, which will work to take place uh, on children's rights in all Commonwealth uh, countries. And of course, we know of the 700 new mixed tenure homes in the east end of Glasgow. And the hundreds of thousands of visitors who descend upon Glasgow were warmly welcomed, experienced a carnival atmosphere, took in the sights and sounds, and were even treated, as Hanzala pointed out, to nice weather, at least most of the time. It is beyond comprehension to think that a large number of them will not be back as tourists in the near future. I not only am convinced they will come back, I know they will. But there is, of course, one legacy that perhaps cannot be measured. The pride and self-confidence felt by the people of Glasgow and Scotland have undoubtedly just hosted the best games ever. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Jackson Carlow. Six minutes, please, Mr. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I speak first and foremost as a Glaswegian, as someone who was born, educated, raised, employed for most of my life, as someone who invested in and around the city of Glasgow. And what a joyous three weeks for every Glaswegian it has been. And I couldn't help reflect, even as the bunting still flew and as the cheers died, that the Commonwealth returned to Glasgow to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the commencement of the Second World War. And let us not forget that Glasgow and Scotland contributed disproportionately to the uh, British effort in that war and to the sacrifice that was endured. And how opposite was it that 100 years later, Instead of leaving Glasgow and Scotland, our finest to fight on the battlefields of France, a hundred years later, our finest were competing on the sporting battlefields of our own home city, the second city of that now long forgotten empire. And I also thought, as you watched the lawn bowls at Kelvin Grove, that behind that sporting arena, there stood the legacy of a previous international exhibition in Glasgow in 1901, itself paid for by the international exhibition of 1888, to which 5.8 million people came. In 1938, Glasgow hosted the great exhibition to which 12.5 million people came over that year. And I remember as a schoolboy looking at the pictures of that, it was meant to be a celebration of empire, but instead it was a celebration of technological advance with pavilions that reminded me then of Walter Pidgeon and the Forbidden Planet movie and of Dan Dare comics. I only wish I had been someone who was able to be at that exhibition. Its hopes, of course, cruelly dashed within months as we went to war. 50 years later, I recall vividly the Garden Festival in Glasgow, to which 4.3 million people came, 40% more than were anticipated, of the Coca-Cola ride, of the Clydesdale Bank Tower, which worked rather more efficiently than its <laughs> successor, of the Bells Bridge, of the McTaggart and Meikle Milk Bar, of the Rotundas, brought back into the life of the city at that time. And then finally of the 1990 Year of Culture, 10,000 performances to which some 9 million visitors came. I remember singing along to Nelson Dorma with Pavarotti and crooning along to the songs with Frank Sinatra at Ibox. I remember as, Miss, as the band left the stage saying Mr. Ibrox, Mr. Sinatra doesn't do uh, encores, for one of the very few occasions in his career, he came back and did one. Such had been the welcome of Glasgow. He sang the summer rains by this time in a soaking dinner suit. Because, sorry, the summer winds by this time in a soaking dinner suit with the Glasgow summer rains. I mention all of this both to point to Glasgow's ability throughout its long history to rise to the occasion, whatever its difficulties, and we still have terrible public health difficulties in Glasgow, but to rise to the occasion when one of these big events is presented to it, and also to dwell on the concept of legacy. Now, why was it ever in doubt, given the success of all these other great exhibitions and events that Glasgow could host an event? I don't know. But the interesting thing about them all is they were exhibitions and events foremost directed to the rest of the United Kingdom. What was unique about this event is that Glasgow sold itself to the rest of the world. And the rest of the world came, and you know what they found? They found that they had family and friends and neighbours who were already living as part of the city of Glasgow. Because for my money, it is the most harmonious, integrated and multicultural city within the United Kingdom, with a tremendous track record of welcoming people, not as strangers, but as family when they come to the city and participate and enjoy these great events. And I hope there's talk of us bidding for the European Games at a future date. I hope we do, and I, I hope we have that success. Looking at the legacy, well, 
I suppose you don't measure it in terms of bricks and mortar. Of that old exhibition, only the Kelvin Hall and the Glasgow Museum remain. Of the Empire exhibition, I went once looking for the buildings and found one. I tried to read what it said. My wife was bewildered because when I read it out, it said, Laso Fart. She pointed out to me that if you restored the letters that were missing, it said Palace of Art. But that took me time to work out. Um, it will be measured not in bricks and mortar, but in the confidence and stride of the city, in the energy, passion and commitment and goodwill that we bring to ensuring that the legacy of this Games is to tackle the public health record of the city of Glasgow itself. I came back to the Games from Switzerland where I patted myself in the back for going up in a cable car, enjoying a very nice lunch and walking down the hill, only to find Swiss families and their children walking back up the hill, <laughs> passing me on the way. I think we too often take the easy option, whether it's the lift in this building or whether it's the, the soft rather than the physically um, attractive or unattractive route. That's what we've got to try and encourage in the primary school children to which Liz uh, Smith's amendment refers. I hope that there is a legacy for Clyde, Beth Gilmore's wonderful creation. I'm not a big fan of mascots, but this one certainly captured the heart of the city, and I hope Clyde can continue to play a part in it. And I also thank the 10 people who hosted the Clyde costume, including Brian Borland, who I was delighted to see was given one of the UK Points of Light Award uh, for his efforts by the Prime Minister. Of course, the legacy exists in the medals for individuals, for families, for communities. Too invidious to name any. And of course, in that golden cone rather than post boxes on top of the Wellington statue, surely that actually represents an award to the people of Glasgow, to all those volunteers, to the organisers, to the public services, to the armed forces. I want to thank three politicians, Jack McConnell for his inspiration in bringing the Games to the city, Sir John Major, who I was delighted to see at the gymnastics event, who instituted the National Lottery, which for a generation of young athletes has given them the consistency of sustained funding in their sports. The reward for that must have given him great pride. And of course, to the Cabinet Secretary herself. I think, you know, it's been many years in which she's had to wait for this success to unfold. Like Tessa Jowell, I think, who earned the affection and respect of the whole of the United Kingdom for her contribution in the Olympics. I hope she feels rightly proud of herself for the job she did, because I know we all do as well. As you draw to a close. Finally, I just want to say, you know, politicians in sport, it was great to see that banner, Tatty Marshall for First Minister. Was there an MSP here who wouldn't like not just to have Charlie Flynn's boxing skills, but his ability to coin all those bon mots? As a, Glaswegian, as a Glaswegian presiding officer, I've always known I come from a city without a castle. Please. Rather, I come from a city with a heart bigger than any other. What a heart. What a city. What a games. What a people. What a team, Kenny Stewart. What a country. This, is there anyone here who doesn't stand taller and prouder of our city this summer? Let that be the legacy and the commitment and drive we bring to ensuring Thank that you. that legacy produces a success. Thank you very much. For Patricia Ferguson, eight minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, follow that, if you will. Um, uh, Jackson Carlaw's comments, though, about um, the uh, experience of Glasgow and Glasgow being an inclusive city is, of course, right. And he is also right to say that we need to begin uh, in our primary schools. And, in fact, I would go further and say we need to begin in our nursery schools and in our homes in allowing our young people to be physically literate and to be able to take that skill forward for, for them. But for those of us of a certain age, um, in case we feel left out, I can tell you that my father, who's now 90, uh, won a bronze and a silver in the Erskine Holmes Commonwealth Games and proudly told me that uh, he was aiming for gold in four years' time. <laughs> so there's hope for us all yet. But I was struck by uh, a comment Aileen Murray made because it reminded me of something I'd been thinking about last night, and that is that, in effect, the Games this year are a legacy of the 2002 Games, because it was the inspiration that it gave to Jack McConnell and to Elaine Murray as the Sports Minister at the time to think that this is something that we could do. This is something that perhaps one of our cities could do, because at that point it was still uh, not decided where the Games would actually be held. There was actually a competition, if we recall, between Edinburgh and Glasgow for that honour. But not, not only were those games a legacy directly of the 2002 uh, event in Manchester, but also the Commonwealth Endowment Fund was a legacy of the 2002 games in Manchester because it struck Jack McConnell at the time that he was so impressed by our athletes and by the hard work they'd done and the dedication that they'd shown. But when he discussed with them the biggest challenges that they faced, 
Some of it was about their facilities and some of it was about coaching and other issues. But the thing that they all identified was that there was no money to help them to get to and from a games. There was no setup that allowed them to be properly kitted out for the events they were going to do. He thought that was wrong and established then an endowment fund that has continued to accrue over the years and which is still the money that helps our athletes to get to the Games and to be able to compete to the best of their abilities. So I think that legacy is an important one, one that is perhaps not often talked about, but one that continues with that original sum of money to this day. And it is also what helps us take the size of team that we do. It's easier for us to have a big team when it's a home games. I think it'll be a bit more challenging for us to take a team of the same size to the Gold Coast in a few years' time. But let's aim for it and let's see if we can do it. And I think Liz Smith is absolutely right to say that it's very difficult to define what the legacy should be and to query whether or not politicians should be part of that. And I, I think, as I say, that the idea of our primary schools having to be where um, skills and interest is nurtured is, is absolutely right. But I was also taken by the, the point that Liz Smith made about the broadcasting of sport and how the Commonwealth Games allowed sports that perhaps are not on our television on a daily basis to be broadcast into homes across the Commonwealth, which will no doubt do those sports a real service. But I think it actually goes further than that because many of those sports were sports in which women participate. Some in which only women participate, but some where women participate as well as men. And I think too for young women who, as we know, do not tend to pursue their interest in sport and activity beyond puberty as, as often as their male counterparts would, that's a very important element of it. And indeed, you know, we talk a lot about football being the fastest growing sport for women in Scotland, but it's still not regularly broadcast except on BBC Alpa, for which I'm very grateful because it allows me to catch up with Glasgow City women, who, by the way, are usually the only Scottish team at that point competing in Europe. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and long may that continue. So I think that in that sense, the broadcasting of these games around the Commonwealth has been a great success. And I must admit, I didn't share John Mason's scepticism about whether or not Glasgow should or could or would be able to pull this event off. And I think Drew Smith was right not to ever be in any doubt about that. I think we saw that at a very early stage with the number of people who went online and backed the bid. The number of people who signed up from Glasgow, from Scotland and beyond to say we want these games to come to Glasgow because we think it's Glasgow's time and Glasgow can deliver. And then of course that was followed up by the thousands of people, the 50 odd thousand people who applied to be volunteers. Now, in the course of my volunteer journey, I met people from literally around the world. It, it took me aback that there were people from America coming to volunteer in our games and people coming from Slovenia. And in the team I was working in, there were a number of people who'd also volunteered at Manchester, some at London. And interestingly, some of them are now on a Facebook page because they're going to um, volunteer to go to the Gold Coast as well. Uh, they might get more consistently good weather in the Gold Coast, but I doubt if they'll get as much of a welcome as they did. And I think John, Ma John Mason was right to say we have to think about the demographic of the volunteers. Um, but I think, too, that we have to recognise that if people are travelling a distance to be a volunteer, as many of them did, the likelihood is that they will be in a particular bracket of people who can afford to take on that kind of enterprise. Um, I noticed from some of the information we were given as volunteers that there was one person travelling every day from Lancaster. I cannot imagine doing that, but someone was. And in my own team, there was a young man who'd come up from down south uh, without accommodation and had no accommodation for two days, um, literally slept on sofas for two days where he could find one, until one of the other volunteers said, come and stay with me, and he did for the rest of the, the game. So people were making real sacrifices and doing things that perhaps they shouldn't have been required to do. And I, I do wonder whether the um, fact that the free travel that came with the uniform and with the accreditation that was afforded to those of us traveling in and around the city uh, would actually have been uh, welcome if it had been extended beyond Glasgow. For those volunteers who were travelling perhaps from Ayrshire and Edinburgh, I realise that's a difficult ask, but it's maybe just something that could be looked at if we do anything like that again. But I do think that the idea of providing that kind of 
uh, initiative was a very, very good one. One of the things that has always struck me about the Commonwealth Games, besides the fact that it does always integrate the para-sport with uh, able-bodied sport, is that it is also very, very careful not to include events that require the host nation and the host athletes to have a great outlay of money in order to be able to participate in sport. It doesn't require custom-made kayaking, for example. It doesn't require countries to have that level of infrastructure and expertise. It's the kind of events where, more or less, countries are able to participate with a relatively small amount of facility. And I think that's absolutely right and is part of what we should be doing. And I think Colin Keir, when he was talking about the, the £100 um, trainers, hit the nail in the head, and that was really um, the point I wanted to make about that, because the barriers that are sometimes in place are, are uh, things that we shouldn't allow uh, to be there. In closing, Presiding Officer, I do think that Drew Smith had a, a, a point. I think today's debate naturally has been one where we all want to praise and, and thank people for their efforts, and so we should. And it may be that we should have some regular, but not necessarily frequent, debates about the legacy going forward. Jackson Carlaw mentioned that Glasgow used to be the second city of the empire. After these games, I think we can safely say that it's now the first city of the Commonwealth. Thank you, Ms Ferguson. I now call on Shona Robson to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have till five o'clock. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And uh, it's been great to have a complete agreement in the, the Chamber on the success of the Games. And just to thank members uh, for their, their kind words, um, it's been very much appreciated. I want to respond to as many points as possible that have been made during the, this afternoon's debate. Uh, Patricia Ferguson um, made a number of points. I just want to touch on one or two of them. I think she's absolutely right about the Community Endowment Fund has been really very important in helping athletes uh, to, to compete. Um, I think also her comments about the, the games um, in the, the bigger picture of multi-sports events being probably more on the affordable side than, than perhaps other uh, comparators of, of recent. And I think that's really important because if we're going to see um, future uh, bids come in perhaps from new cities um, and new countries that haven't hosted before, then the costs have to be uh, reasonable. The, the legacy and, uh, of what is achieved in um, hosting the Games has to be visible. And we are very keen, as the most recent host, to tell that story because although, yes, it was a significant amount of public money that has um, been spent on the Games and the infrastructure, actually, um, in terms of value for money and what has been returned, um, it has been um, a very good story to tell. And when you look at what we did with Hamden, we did not uh, um, see that there was a business case for a brand new all singing, all dancing athletic stadium. Uh, and therefore, the engineering solution to convert a football stadium to an athletic stadium was a very much a cost effective solution. And that engineering solution is now there out on the market potentially for other cities mm -hmm. to use. And I think that's really important because, you know, in this uh, day and age um, uh, of, uh, you know, a difficult uh, financial uh, situations, not, not just here, but across the world, um, I think these types of solutions are really, really important in uh, taking the Games forward. Um, we, just on the issue of volunteers, we did um, provide support for those who were uh, less uh, well-off volunteers, although I do recognise that even despite that there were a lot of personal sacrifices by a number of people who wanted uh, to take part in these games. Uh, John Mason asked about the, the kind of profiling of the, the volunteers. I can tell him that there is research being taken forward by the Glasgow Centre for Population Health uh, around the demographic of games uh, volunteers, and that will be published in due uh, course. Uh, Liz Smith um, talked about the better usage of the school estate. We're working very hard on that, as I'm sure she is aware, and also the quality of PE provision, not just the quantity, again, very much the focus of the mo most recent investment 
in, in PE. Um, she did make a point, actually, that's worth reiterating that, um, uh, to pay tribute to, to the BBC, because actually the, their presentation of sport, I thought, was, was excellent, not just on the field of play, but actually the kind of wraparound uh, programmes as well. It made it very accessible. And actually, for some of the minority sports that don't get that profile very often, they have had a tremendous opportunity to profile and sell their sport. And I know that the clubs around those sports have been working very hard to build capacity and anticipation of a, an increased level of interest uh, from people of all ages in taking up and trying those sports. Sandra White, quite rightly, uh, paid tribute to the wider uh, people who made the games a success, the bus drivers, the people who worked in the hotels, the pubs, the clubs, all working hard to deliver a very friendly atmosphere. And I think that counted for a lot in, in how people enjoyed themselves. Uh, Drew Smith quite rightly said we'll all miss Kenny Stewart's emails, um, that we will, uh, and that Glasgow had been gallus and, and generous in putting on a, a good show. Uh, that, that's absolutely right. He asked about uh, further uh, debates. I'm very happy to have further legacy debates. I think it's quite right and proper that we do that to monitor where uh, the progress is being made, and I can certainly give that commitment uh, today. Um, John uh, Pentland uh, asked about the social capital and, and that of the volunteers in my, my statement on Tuesday I made reference to the sharing of data that we had uh, asked volunteers when they uh, applied, whether they were unsuccessful or successful in becoming Clydesiders, whether they would be prepared to have their data shared with Volunteer Scotland and uh, very uh, happily most people did. That means now that Volunteer Scotland are going to be working to signpost volunteers into local volunteering opportunities in their community. And I'm sure we'll get um, a huge boost, not just in sport, but perhaps in other areas of, of life as well, as those volunteers want to continue uh, the, the journey that they've perhaps started for the first time uh, at the Games in uh, Glasgow. Uh, James Dornan mentioned the Celebration City. And I think, again, the community events that went on around the Games were really, really important in creating uh, a buzz, but also reaching out to people who perhaps were not going to be touched by the Games in the traditional sense of going along as a spectator or being a volunteer. And the work that went on at the Old Cathcart Parish Church by Reverend Galbraith was a great example of that. And I had the, the pleasure of visiting the, the Saturday Club, and I have to say the way that uh, those young people were engaged in trying sports, some of them with very, very profound disabilities, was uh, quite remarkable and uh, a fantastic thing to, to witness. Uh, Tavish Scott was quite right to uh, mention uh, some of the other uh, Shetlanders who, uh, as well as Eric Davies, have uh, made their mark, Linda Flaws and Andrea Strach. And, uh, I think it shows that actually throughout Scotland we are producing uh, fantastic athletes uh, and we need to make sure that that, that continues and we certainly uh, will do that. Bob Doris um, mentioned the opportunities in the in Community Empowerment Bill um, being an opportunity for sport. I should mention mentioned that there is, of course, the Legacy 2014 Sustainable uh, Sport for Communities Fund, which uh, is a £1 million fund which aims to support communities to realise their ambitions of owning and running their own sports facilities. And again, one of the national legacy projects that will hopefully see uh, sports facilities take on a new lease of life locally. Um, Elaine Murray, quite rightly, paid tribute to Louise Martin, as I did in my statement on Tuesday, very <laughs> instrumental in bringing the Games uh, to, to Scotland. Uh, I think it was through people who were very visionary, uh, like Louise, that they could see the potential for, for, uh, for Glasgow, Scotland, and for, for sport um, from hosting that event. Marco uh, Biaggi talked about the, the success of Pride House and um, the, the, I suppose the fact that Pride House... Gave, gave a voice to and a platform to people whose voices are not always heard. Um, I thought that was embraced very much uh, by the city. Huge number of visitors uh, visiting the John Byram and Kiss, I think, adding to the very clear but you know, not lecturing message about where we were uh, coming from in terms of equality. And going forward, um, I think we have some real opportunities. Uh, Sports Scotland will, of course, be uh, supporting and promoting the LGBT Sports Charter. 
Uh, we have um, Leap Sport, of course, which we're continuing to, to work with to make sure that barriers are removed from participation in sport, whatever those barriers are. Uh, Colin Keir, quite rightly, also paid tribute to Mike Whittingham from the uh, Sports Scotland Institute's um, that high performance um, model. Uh, very, very technical and scientific these days. I think no one could argue other than it has been a tremendous success. And going forward, the analysis of performance in terms of future funding plans will, of course, uh, be undertaken in an equally scientific, uh, uh, proper manner. George Adam uh, talked about uh, Paisley, uh, as we would um, expect him to do, but importantly mentioned uh, you know, the Sports Hub at St Mirren. Again, a great example of people embracing the opportunity to come together and make sport more accessible. Uh, and Richard Lyle reminded us, of course, that we have some more to come because we have the Ryder Cup at the end of September, when we can once again uh, bask in uh, the, the glory of, of hosting a, a huge event, but more importantly, in, of course, Rosanna Cunningham's constituency, as she's just reminded me. But importantly, again, the opportunity to promote Scotland on the world stage, those images of Scotland uh, and of Glasgow that we've had over the last two weeks, we have an opportunity to uh, get um, again promote those fantastic, iconic images of Glen Eagles and of Scotland to the rest of the world. And that is a, a huge opportunity for us that we will uh, not uh, miss. Hansala Malik paid tribute to parents, and um, I think he's absolutely right. You know, every elite athlete starts their career by being um, you know, taken from. Uh, you know, club to competition uh, and, and that huge sacrifice that parents and families make, uh, seeing someone through from an interest in sport right through to the elite performance cannot be underestimated. I think it was quite, quite right and proper that we remember the role of, of parents uh, in that. And just finally um, to end on uh, with Kenny Gibson's uh, comments about the, the Para Sports Centre. I think it is uh, a great opportunity for us to add to our fantastic uh, array of national centres and state-of-the-art facilities that we now have in Scotland that we can add a, a para-sport centre onto that. And when you look at the network of whether it's the local 150-plus community sports hubs that will be delivered, the opening up of the school estate, through to the regional facilities that are providing um, both communities and athletes with really good facilities, right through to the state-of-the-art national facilities. Um, if we think back to 10 years ago, uh, there was very little of that. And I think now um, we have a, a picture there of sporting infrastructure that is uh, there with the best of them. Uh, what's important is what we make of that and keeping using it and making sure that we uh, um, get the best out of those assets. And I, for one, will, will be leading that to make sure that we do. So thanks again to everybody who took part in this very constructive and good debate this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. In concluding the debate on the legacy of the 20th Commonwealth Games in Scotland, can I remind members that they are all invited to join me and the First Minister, along with representatives of all the organisations involved with the Commonwealth Games, in the garden lobby from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock on Wednesday, the 13th of August. That's Wednesday coming. It will give us an opportunity as a parliament to celebrate the Games and to thank those that worked so hard to make these Games the best ever. Uh, we now move to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 10736.2 in the name of Patricia Ferguson, which seeks to amend motion number 10736 in the name of Shona Robinson on the legacy of the 20th Commonwealth Games be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 10736.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 10736 in the name of Shona Robinson on the legacy of the 20th Commonwealth Games be agreed to. Are we all agreed? And this amendment is agreed to. The next question is that motion number 10736 in the name of Shona Robinson as amended on the legacy of the 20th Commonwealth Games be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time and I now close this meeting.